Well, I went to like the more conservative school committee debate forum that only the conservative candidates went to. Some older guy handed me what's basically their trans panic booklet with information with a tiny bit of truth, a tiny bit of true information, a lot of false information, and then a supplement of information that is misleadingly presented. So before we got into this, I just wanted to show that on the physical copy I have, I'm going to be going off the digital copy to like debunk stuff. You can see that they have a couple of, you know, religious organizations that are backing this. But also they have the, uh, the Heritage Foundation that is partially responsible for supporting this. And that just gets a little bit ironic when you see them complain later in this document about well-funded pro-LGBT organizations pushing shit in schools. So they're doing the same shit. It just, it's not that there's anything inherently wrong with funded organizations, you know, putting out their little propaganda pamphlets. It's just funny that they're hypocrites. The Heritage Foundation is, you know, a conservative group that I'm more familiar with. This parents of ROGD kids thing, this ROGD term that's made up that one researcher tried to push and it hasn't even caught on. Uh, we're going to talk about that later. It's going to be really fun, but I'm getting ahead of myself and spending time talking about something I don't need to when there's a million fucking things to get to. All right. So it starts off with the endorsements of like the people who support it. And this is something that they want to hand to parents. So let's just start reading. <clears throat> Why is it that so many young people today are wondering if they were born in the wrong body? I'm not going to read literally every sentence in this booklet. I have enough to talk about as it is, but I'm going to go through parts of it. With popular endorsements coming from the culture law and even the medical establishment, the transgender phenomenon has gone from a set of ideas to a popular trend, leaving schools scrambling to formulate a compassionate response to this controversial issue. This is one thing they all do that, despite me not liking them, I will give them credit. Uh, they do a good job of presenting themselves in a very appealing light where they're, they're trying to put forth that we're compassionate but we think what you guys are doing is wrong even though all the evidence suggests that otherwise <laughs> and all of the medical consensus suggests that gender affirming care is good we want to compassionately tell you that you're wrong and that we want to do basically conversion therapy because we're the compassionate ones uh and we'll get through why conversion therapy doesn't work and why uh, they're full of shit about all their claims about gender affirming care later. Where do I want to start? Oh yeah, I wanted to stop. So here they have this bit where they say, um, some argue that the best school policies permit students to identify something other than their sex, gender affirming care, but this approach has had negative consequences on privacy, First Amendment rights, fair play in sports, children's health, parental oversight. The privacy part is hilarious because... At the end of the day, what you have mostly is a bunch of political organizations and some parents of people, of mostly of kids who aren't trans, who are big mad that their kids either hear about trans stuff through, in schools through like some library books or something, or because their kid had to like refer to a trans person as a pronoun and the parents got upset saying that their First Amendment rights are being violated because they were being forced to you know refer to people by their gender pronouns or you know the government will come after them that's not really true what is true is that if you were for example in a work environment or i suppose in a school environment and you were purposefully going up to say a trans man who someone who was assigned female at birth but who later identified as a man and you kept on like harassing them by intentionally fucking with them calling them like a, a girl on purpose or saying uh she and her over and over again repeatedly not on accident but to get a rise out of them or for example if you kept calling them sweetie and honey those are the things where they could then go ahead and hit you with a harassment lawsuit under discrimination because they had added transgender people under the umbrella of here's 
a group of people you can't discriminate against, right under race and, like, general sex. Just the same way that you couldn't harass someone at work and school for being a woman or being another race. They made it so that you could not harass someone for being trans. They turned this, and when I say they, I mean the people who are writing this document and the conservative and the people who talk online like Jordan Peace Peterson, they painted this as if you accidentally misgender someone once, you're going to go to jail or some dumb shit. That's not what happened. And I have uh, sources for this, but I'm just going to give a brief overview of these things. And I have something down here I highlighted. And then I'll start banging out these fucking tabs. So the First Amendment rights thing is dog shit. Fair play in sports. We'll get to that towards the end. Um, it's one of the arguments I'll give them more charity for. But in the context of a school setting, uh, it's not cool to you know, otherize the kids who are trans and not allow them to play. Uh, and we'll get to the whole, is it fair, dot, 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 arguments later. Children's health. It, children's health, it actually, there's a million studies I'm going to be showing that gender-affirming care is the best thing for children's health, but obviously they disagree with that. We'll get to it. And parental oversight. The funny thing is, for the parents who have trans kids, they are the ones who are typically, they're very supportive and they want the school to be supportive of them. And the teachers are trying to support them. But it's these parents, these other random parents, like the lady Jessica Almeida, who is running for school committee in, you know, the Bristol school district. Her kids aren't trans, but she complains about the trans stuff a lot because she's really fucking mad that a librarian in her school ran a book, a biography of a trans, uh, a trans person who was also, you know, in the military, helping people in other ways, uh, to her kid. And she, her kid isn't trans. She's not related to this issue. She's literally just mad that her kid is now aware of the existence of trans people. So when, when this, when people who write this booklet talk about how they're concerned about parental oversight, that's bullshit. They don't care about parental oversight. If there's a parent who's totally okay with their trans kids and wants them to be supported in school, and they want to give that their own kid uh, the gender-affirming care that their doctor has told them is best, they don't actually support that. They don't support that parent's decision to do that. It's not about parental oversight or the parent being able to do as they see fit. Otherwise, they would not be... Opposing, you wouldn't see all these parents who aren't the parents of trans kids opposing this issue because they're the ones who are talking about it so much. This is bullshit. They don't care about this. Uh, and then under here on this next paragraph, what's, what, what is this booklet's solution for dealing with people with gender dysphoria? It is our hope that this guide will help you make a positive and effective case for policies that encourage acceptance and diversity in a way that communicates to every student that they were born in the right body. You'll see as we go through, well, you guys don't support gender-affirming care. What exactly is your solution for gender dysphoria? Because you acknowledge it a lot in this document. They will say that you should try to help them come to terms with their biological body and their biological sex, but they don't actually provide an alternate solution to dealing with dysphoria. They have no alternative to gender-affirming care. They literally just say, well, <laughs> just you go to therapy and work out your issues uh, in another way. We don't know, LOL. Just come to terms with your body, LOL. It's like, oh, wow, great answer. How fucking deep and insightful of you. Uh, it's because at the end of the day, their solution is conversion therapy. That's what they want. They want to convince people who have gender dysphoria, kids who have gender dysphoria, who are trans, that you're not trans. You just, you're just having a lot of issues uh, dealing with your, your self-identity and your body. Uh, they don't go into any real detail about how to handle those issues because this 
the people who write this booklet don't have any answers because they don't know anything, even though they pretend to. All right. So we we uh, touched on this. What what is the so all of and they will acknowledge it at one point in this booklet. All of the medical institutions in this country and in other countries, by the way, stand against them as an overwhelming consensus. Uh, you know, they're the few, the brave and the bold, I suppose. But let's see what these guys, the people who actually study this for a living, not the people who make pretty booklets for conservatives, for conservative parents. Let's see what they have to say about conversion therapy. For example, the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry finds no evidence to support the application of a therapeutic intervention operating under the premise that a specific orientation, gender identity, which is the part that refers to trans people, or gender expression is pathological. Furthermore, based on the scientific evidence, the AACAP asserts that such conversion therapies or other interventions imposed with the intent of promoting a particular sexual orientation, straight, and or gender, you know, being cis male or cis woman, as a preferred outcome, lacks scientific credibility and clinical utility. Additionally, there is evidence that such interventions are harmful. As a result, conversion therapies should not be part of any behavioral tr health treatment of children and adolescents. However, there is... This in no way detracts from the standard of care, which requires that clinicians facilitate the developmentally appropriate open exploration of sexual, sexual orientation, gender identity, and or gender expression without any predetermined outcome. So when the booklet that I'm going to be reading to you tries to make claims like, oh, they try to push people to be trans, they try to push people to be trans, that is not true. If someone starts early on in their care, where they're just starting out by changing their name and the way they dress and the way they do their hair to either look more masculine and more feminine. And partway through, they realize, actually, I don't think this is actually the right treatment for me. I think I might have another issue. The, right now, the medical consensus, the mainstream consensus is, oh, okay, then we won't do this. Then you're not trans and we won't do it this way anymore. So when the conservatives fear monger about that, they're full of shit too. But we will get to more on that later. Did I need this for anything else? I'm pretty sure I just needed that part. The American Psychoanalytic Association. It affirms the right. Yeah, yeah, that's great. That's not what I wanted. Psychoanalytic technique does not encompass purposeful attempts to convert, repair, change, or shift an individual sexual orientation, gender identity, or gender expression. Such directed efforts are against fundamental principles of psychoanalytic treatment and often result in substantial psychological pain by reinforcing damaging internalized attitudes. They talk about how parents are the primary educators of their children. Uh, though they entrust their child to public school, they're responsible for overseeing their education, and they want schools to inform, involve, and respect them. Basically, what this boils down to is a lot of parents were just unaware that there are, for example, mentioned, well, I meant to say references. <laughs> I butchered the noun there. There are references to trans people sometimes in like a fucking library book that's read at an elementary school. Like, oh, this is a biography of a trans person and they did this thing and that thing. It was really interesting. And then parents will latch onto that and lose their fucking minds because, oh my God, I didn't want my child to know that trans people exist. This is horrible. So... When they talk about this, this is typically the issue they're latching onto. Uh, this is again related to the issue that Jessica Almeida had uh, with the Bristol School District, which she complained loudly about as a parent, but refuses to refer to directly now that she's running for office because she knows that appearing uh, anti-LGBT is probably not going to get her a lot of positive attention while she is running for office. And then they do the compassionate angle again here. They're like, oh, well, they deserve the same educational opportunities and resources, and they should be treated with respect, and they shouldn't be bullied. Uh, but they're still going to have all the wrong, inaccurate, and ineffective opinions about how to deal with things like gender dysphoria. Um, the problem with this booklet is not going to be that they're, like, outwardly hateful and, like, you know, 
particularly malicious, at least um, on the face of it, towards trans people. It's that all of their opinions about this issue are dog shit. All the solutions they offer lead to harm for these kids. And all the actual like medical consensus versions of care for these issues that they come out against are actually the appropriate answer to these issues. And they all just bring out the dumbest uh, bits of misinformation to try to make it seem otherwise. I don't even know why they brought this part in, but we'll get to it. So, let's start. They have some fast facts here. The first one is, one study showed that when a teen announces a transgender identity to their peer group, the number of friends who also became transgender identified was 3.5 per group. So, what they're trying to do here is they're trying to make it seem like, well, they're just doing it because their friends are doing it. It's a trend thing. It's trendy to be trans, and so everyone just wants to jump on the bandwagon. Um, well, there might be people who do this in the short term. None of the people who are, like, trans in the long term who are, like, you know, going through the arduous process of going through hormone therapy and all that shit. None of those people are the people who are doing it as a trend. Um, it's, especially on Twitter, it's possible that some people are doing it for those reasons but it, it's nowhere near as prevalent as they say and even if they are you can't you shouldn't throw the baby out with the bathwater. the actual trans people who need gender affirming care shouldn't suffer just because uh you want to focus on the people who are doing it as a trend so that's that's one thing and then they also have this blurb on another page that I, I kind of doing out of order, but I wanted to talk about it now before I went through my links. When teens identify as trans, the growing phenomenon of teens suddenly identifying as transgender after, ex after exposure to the concept through peers and social media is described by some researchers, mostly one, but I guess there might be others who referred to her term as well, as rapid onset gender dysphoria. Though ROGD is poorly understood and under-researched because there's, because there's like no evidence for this being like a useful term to describe this phenomenon, that's why it's poorly understood and under-researched because it's not a widely accepted term. Go figure. Anyway, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself and making fun of them. Preliminary observations describe a sudden unhappiness with one sex that presents, particularly in female adolescents, who showed no signs of discomfort with their sex before puberty. Okay, this line is particularly dumb. Hi, Kyle. Love you, buddy. This line is particularly dumb because if people are going to experience gender dysphoria, it's going to start happening during puberty. It's not going to happen before puberty. If, if you knew anything about this issue, they wouldn't have written this sentence, right? Most of the problems and this discomforts that come from dysphoria come when your hormones go wild during puberty that's obvious and i hope i have like a link up here i'm not sure i grabbed a specific link up here that talked about that because i figured that was obvious but maybe there are some people out there who need that explained so maybe i should have gone and done that anyway observational evidence and anecdotal reports show a similar pattern may be emerging in young male adults the following quotes from parents and teens and they they have a lot of fucking uh, uh I, i'll go to the page eventually but on the, there they have a lot of uh quotes from parents and teens who go oh my child was perfectly happy and then all of a sudden when they started hitting puberty they started getting unhappy and i i didn't understand all of their friends were doing it too so i thought they got it from them but basically a lot of quotes like that we'll get to it this is one of the links they had I believe it was this link right here. If you go down, yes, it is. When they talk about the Lisa lady who was doing the study, who said that, oh, they're just doing it as a trend. They're, when their friends identify that way, they're more likely to. Um, this is the publication. This is the article basically on PubMed, or not PubMed. The National Library of Medicine, where she put her report. But if you read this, what you see is that the study is just 
from a survey of parents like and she got oh my god i fucking forgot about this until just now she got all of her information from this from parents she recruited from three websites that were all like based on parents who were concerned about trans issues like <laughs> I'm, I, I'm doing a poor job of uh, explaining it Let, let's go to the wikipedia article The rapid onset, because um, she's the the Lisa Littman lady is the one, or the, is it Leslie? I'm sorry, am I butchering her fucking name right now? No, it's Lisa. The Lisa <laughs> Littman lady who came up with this term, uh, she's the one who put up this study. It was a 2018 study. It was supposed to study... Uh, Gender dysphoria caused by peer influence and social contagion. It's never been recognized by any major professional association as a valid mental health diagnosis, and its use has been actively discouraged by the American Psychological Association and the American Psychiatric Association. The World Professional Association for Transgender Health, obviously they're going to, uh, and other medical organizations due to a lack of reputable scientific evidence outside of a few fucking parents from three fucking websites and major surveying issues for the concept. Uh, it's been criticized as anti-trans propaganda and, most importantly, bad science. She was an adjunct assistant professor at the Akan School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. She created the term based on an online survey of parents on three anti-trans websites who believed that their teenage children had suddenly, had suddenly manifested symptoms of gender dysphoria and begun identifying as transgender simultaneously with other children in their peer group. She, uh, the lady speculated that rapid onset of gender dysphoria should be a coping, could be a social coping mechanism for other disorders. She published her study in PLOS One in 2018, then criticism of her methodology and conclusions was voiced by clinicians, researchers, and obviously by transgender activists. Uh, the, the PLOS One responded by announcing a post-publication review of the paper, and then Brown University retracted its press release promoting the study. There was controversy, people were mad both that she did the bad study and then people on the other side were mad that oh she's being shut down she's being censored but eventually she put up a correction to her study that made it more clear that the data was only based on survey of parents hilariously enough from three anti-trans websites anti-trans activist websites um so she was more clear about the limitations of her study uh and added that rapid onset gender dysphoria does not apply to all cases of gender dysphoria and doesn't imply that there is no one who benefits from transition. I thought that this was some good background to go through when looking at this. This is actually the lady. And then this is just an article in science on science.org talking about the controversy around the paper. But I think the Wikipedia article covered it pretty well. And I don't necessarily think that... I think... Well, it actually is interesting to see <laughs> where she got her information. The fucking websites that this lady recruited parents from were Transgender Trend, which actually, funnily enough, this fucking booklet will cite multiple times because it's a, you know, I guess a middling well-known anti-trans website uh fourth wave now and youth trans crit trans critical professionals so you know not exactly pulling a very diverse sample a representative sample of data for her study so when this article when this booklet is pushing fast facts to back back up to the issue and to the booklet that I received at a school committee debate forum. When this booklet is pushing fact fun facts uh, to concerned conservative parents about this. And they read, oh wow, apparently kids are more likely to be trans if their friends are. Uh, it's, it's all just social contagion. Even the lady who wrote the study, the really poorly 
constructed study will say, I don't believe that n there's no one out there who benefits from gender affirming care. And I don't believe that everyone who identifies as trans is doing it because it's a trend. And uh, that's also obvious. If it was, if it was, you know, only people doing it as a trend, there wouldn't have been people doing it 30 years ago. And yet somehow there are people who are trans 30 years ago. Not that any of these people knew about that because it wasn't a popular issue to, you know, for conservatives to get upset about at the time. So that's why I got that. So we spent more than enough time on those points. Let's fucking... X out those tabs and move on to the next thing. I'm not going to address literally every single fucking thing in this booklet. Um, I'm addressing the stuff that I feel is most important to debunk. Or to provide more nuance to. Or to, in some very rare cases, maybe later give credit to. So, the next one. Up to 98% of children who struggle with their sex as a boy or girl come to accept their sex by adulthood. All right. So, the up to 98% is a little bit misleading. I believe I pulled up. This is the article that they cite for their claim. A letter to the edit editor um, from Michael Laid... Actually, from multiple people. This letter to the editor written by these people on Edocrine Treatment of Gender Dysphoric, Gender Incongruent Persons, Endocrine Society, Clinical Practice Guideline. Where is their 98%? All right. There are no laboratory imaging or other objective tests to diagnose a true transgender child. That part's true. Gender with gen Ooh, I can't speak. Children with gender dysphoria will outgrow this condition in 61% to 98% of cases by adulthood. And then they link to a source there. There's currently no way to predict who will desist and who will remain dysphoric. So for this, uh it when the booklet gives you the figure. I just want to point this out. They don't say 61 to 98% because that doesn't sh sound that strong. They say up to 98% of children who struggle with their sex as a boy or girl will come to accept. And it's like, what does up to mean? Either it's 98% or it's not. But the range that's actually given by the source itself is 61 to 98%. They didn't put that in there because they didn't feel as strong you'll find them doing this where they'll leave convenient bit they'll leave out convenient bits of information that make their claims seem less strong and also if there are children who outgrow gender dysphoria or they find out when they grow up that being trans isn't their issue gender affirming care isn't what they need that's perfectly fine that is not in any way a rebuttal of the need for gender affirming care for people who have dysphoria when they have it if they if they if they find out that that's not their problem later on, that's great. Okay, we don't need to do that for them. We need to find out other issues. But there's a lot of people for whom that is the problem, and they need that treatment. So why the fuck would we throw the baby out with the bathwater? That's the one. That's the first problem with this. I believe that this might be their source. Aha. So you see that they make this claim, children with gender dysphoria will outgrow this condition 61% to 98% of cases by adulthood. And then you see them source this claim. Oh, well, let's go to this source. Okay. This gets to be like a fucking Russian doll thing where you go to it, you see a piece of information sort, uh, sourced, and then you go to that citation, you go to that source, and then they cite their number, and then you have to go to their source. It gets really fucking annoying after a while, but I'm not complaining. Anyway. Oh, this happens with everyone. I'm not just saying that the conservatives are doing it, by the way. I'm saying that this is always the case. Huh. So, where did these people get 61 to 98%? Oh, I might just have... I might have pulled this up, but I think you have to purchase the actual fucking article to even... Uh, to even access this. Let's go to... An article from the New York Times. There's other because there is other data that disagrees with the claims that they're making. So there's a let's see here. A study from the Trans Youth Project following three hundred and seventeen children across the United States and Canada who
who underwent a so-called social transition between ages 3 and 12. That When the social transition, when they say that, they just mean the name, the pronouns, maybe the way they dress in their hair. That's, for, that's what they're referring to. Participants transitioned on average at age six and a half. Again, that's social transitioning, not any weird surgery shit in case you were wondering. The vast majority of the group still identified with their new gender five years later, according to the study. And many had begun hormonal medications in adolescence to prompt biological changes to align with their gender identities. So they're doing hormone therapy. The study found that 2.5% of the group had reverted to identifying as the gender they were assigned at birth. So before, and this claim, they were saying 61 to 98% grow out of it when they grow into adults. But then we have other conflicting data from this trans youth project referenced by the New York Times that says on the majority of this group, most of them actually did continue. So, okay, is there more information on this? And I would love to dive into this study that was done more to learn more about it. The story that my opposition is citing, but unfortunately it seems I hit a paywall and I'm, I can't really get any farther than that. If it came out that so, like, there's some truth to like, sometimes the kids grow out of it, that doesn't take away from trans issues. And then it's just, you, you know, when they're experiencing gender dysphoria, you give them gender affirming care if it becomes at some point not the right answer for them then that's totally fine to stop there's no harm in that there the anti-trans booklet of course is going to argue that there is harm but we're going to get to that later but again don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. there are trans kids who need that gender affirming care and to say, oh, it's all bad because they might change their mind later. That literally doesn't make any fucking sense. So that's the story on that. Uh, we have conflicting studies from, you know, opposing ideological sides. Well, actually, we think 61 to 98 uh, percent actually will grow out of it. Well, then, first of all, why do you care so much? And secondly, it's weird that you have a range. Then you have this other group that says, oh, well, we have this 317 uh, size sample of trans people. And most of them actually did continue through their adolescence. So it is kind of strange, though, that on the one hand, this study will say most of them go grow out of it by childhood. But then they'll say, oh, my God, but if they start using puberty blockers, when they start hitting puberty, then all of them will continue on. And it's really horrible that they do. And I was like, wait, but I thought you said they all grew out of it. It sounds like that's not the case. So. That was just that was just interesting to me, but I guess the two, I guess they're trying to say that most of the people who don't continue on to use puberty blockers blockers will go on to use you know hormone therapy, but I guess that's not necessarily uh, them contradicting themselves. But it was just it was an interesting to think about. All right, so we have that. We handled that. Then we have this other claim made by the book. <clears throat> After sex reassignment surgery, transgender identified people are nearly 20 times more likely to die from suicide than the general population. I mean, I saw plenty of data that suggested... Oh, excuse me. This I had the wrong claim in mind. For this claim, what they're not stating is that transgender people, with or without uh, treatment, are more likely to commit suicide, which is tragic. They're trying to say, well, after sex reassignment surgery, oh, they're, they're still so prone to suicide. What they don't tell you is that if they don't get the gender affirming surgery, they're even more likely than this to commit suicide. They're trying to make it sound like the sex reassignment surgery leads people to commit suicide, but that's not actually true. They pulled this number because it's higher than the, you know, societal norm for the likelihood to commit suicide. But what they don't tell you is that it would have been worse if they didn't have the surgery. But anyway, let's go. Their source for this was a uh, journal in PLOS One, long-term follow-up of transsexual persons undergoing sex reassignment surgery, cohort study in Sweden. So what's their data for suggesting this? I mean, wh where did they get the figure in the first place? And their control group was, uh, unless I'm reading this incorrectly, just cis people of the same birth sex. 
So they're like trying to tell you as if this is some new information. By the way, did you know that trans people are unfortunately more likely to commit suicide? It's like literally everyone knew that, but okay. But they're trying to pass it off as if the surgery is what led to it. And that's not true. These people are saying that they think that sex reassignment, although alleviating dysphoria, may not suffice as treatment. And that the, it should inspire improved psychiatric and somatic care after sex reassignment. Oh my fucking god. Okay. I'm not, re I'm not an idiot. I'm not misreading this study. They fucking are. The people who made this study are not saying that you shouldn't have people go through sexual reassignment surgery. They're saying that there needs to be improved care after that happens. They say it to transitioning does alleviate dysphoria, but there needs to be better treatment after that fact <laughs> to fucking realize how fucking hard they were lying about that. And now I come to my own articles that I read about this. This one is called Ensuring Comprehensive Care and Support for Transgender and Gender Diverse Children and Adolescents. So basically what I was trying to do with these sources that are coming up is I was demonstrating that gender affirming care leads to better outcomes and leads to less likelihood of tragic things like suicide than what this stupid fucking book wants, which is for you to do basically the conversion therapy for trans people shit where... You try to you try to convince them to just accept their, you know, assigned sex at birth and be happy with that and then figure out some way to make them happy down the line, something that will not happen. Providers work together to destigmatize gender variants, promote the child's self-worth, facilitate access to care, educate f Oh, by the way, I should have fucking said in the first place. Uh remember where I was. This is from the American Academy of Pediatrics. Providers work together to destigmatize gender variants, promote the child's self-worth, facilitate access to care, educate families, and advocate for safer community spaces. Specialized gender affirmative therapists, when available, may be an asset in helping children and their families build skills for dealing with gender-based stigma, address symptoms of anxiety or depression, and reinforce the child's overall resiliency. There is a limited but growing body of evidence that suggests that using an integrated affirmative model, as in gender affirmation, the thing that this anti-trans booklet opposes, results in young people having fewer mental health concerns, whether they ultimately identify as transgender. So even in here, they're saying, you know, whether they ultimately identify as transgender, if that becomes not the answer for them later, that's perfectly fine. But the gender affirmative care helps them when they're experiencing the dysphoria. In contrast, conversion or reparative treatment models are used to prevent children and adolescents from identifying as transgender or to dissuade them from exhibiting gender diverse expressions. The Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, I'll be looking at their page later, has concluded that any therapeutic intervention with the goal of changing a youth's gender expression or identity is inappropriate. Reparative approaches have been proven to not only be unsuccessful, so you won't even be successful in convincing them that they're not trans, by the way. If you think that you're going to be able to do that, with the, which these conservative fucking idiot parents think they can, it's not going to happen. But also, delet- oh my god, what is this fucking vocab word? Hold on. Deleterious. Causing harm or damage, thank you. But also deleterious, thank you for the vocab word, by the way, AAP, and are considered outside the mainstream of traditional medical practice. And then a bunch of links, some of which I'm going to go to, but a lot of them are paywalled, so it wouldn't be very helpful to go to them because I'm not going through the paywall. Anyway, but also there was the Russian doll thing when I was following these citations where they cited this. Oh, this source cited this. And I kept trying to dig through, but eventually I always hit paywall, so it's unfortunate. The AAP described reparative approaches as unfair and deceptive. At the time of this writing, conversion therapy was banned by... Okay, yeah, it's great. So, when the book says that there's not information out there saying that gender affirmative care is helpful and conversion therapy is bad, they are lying. The consensus opinion of the medical professions is that these therapies lack, referring to up here, conversion therapies, consensus opinion 
of the medical professions is that conversion therapies lack demonstrated efficacy in achieving their goals, which are themselves questionable from an ethical perspective and are associated with numerous negative outcomes, including lower self-esteem, self-hatred, depression, and suicidality. So I wanted to follow these fucking sources, but God forbid I see the source citations without paying through the paywall. So great, I guess. And then we have this from the formerly referred to substance abuse and let me see if I can remember mental health What is SA 33 remind me to go back to page 33. Seriously? Oh, yeah, I can't type in zero, you idiot. Um, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration from this organization. Let's go. There is a scientific consensus that for many people, medical intervention in the form of hormone therapy or gender-affirming surgeries may be medically necessary to alleviate gender dysphoria. American Medical Association, American Psychological Association, Anton, World Professional Association for Transgender Health. I know that people are, that conservatives would probably attack the other, that association for being a trans organization, but all these other medical associations agree with them. Historically, conversion therapy efforts to make children's behaviors, dress, and mannerisms more consistent with those stereotypically expected of their assigned sex at birth, i.e. more masculine for male at birth, more feminine for female at birth, were the primary clinical approach with, used with children experiencing gender dysphoria. Efforts to change children's gender expression have been made with the goal of preventing a transgender identity, as well as with the goal of preventing a future minority sexual orientation. Such efforts were based on the belief that variations in gender identity and expression are pathological and that certain patterns of family relationships cause a transgender identity or minority sexual orientation. Research has not supported these theories or interventions. American Psychological Association. Because there is a scientific consensus that gender dysphoria in adolescence is unlikely to remit. So this goes against what they were saying before with the, with the source that I found uh, that claim that 61 to 98 percent of them grow out of it blah 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 uh and when i had the other uh like 300 sample size study that the insider or new york times talked about that said actually you know they don't grow out of it now the actual fucking you know the american psychological association is waiting and there is a scientific consensus that is unlikely to remit it's unlikely that they grow out of it in adolescence Without medical in intervention, even though who support gender identity change efforts with prepubertal children generally do not attempt such efforts with adolescents exp experiencing gender dysphoria. Okay, so it's not true that conversion therapy works, and it is also not true that children will grow out of it. Uh, they'll grow out of feeling dysphoric. They will grow out of wanting to be trans. It's not true. <clears throat> Alternative, affirmative, supportive approaches to therapy with transgender and gender diverse children have been developed and are becoming increasingly common. No research has been published in the peer reviewed literature that demonstrates the efficacy of conversion therapy efforts with gender minority youth, nor are any benefits of such interventions to children and their families. Researchers have reported that these interventions are ineffective in decreasing the likelihood of a future same gender sexual orientation or minority sexual or identity. And again, the sexual identity part is the part that we're concerned about, not the orientation. In addition to a lack of evidence for the efficacy of conversion therapy with gender minority youth, there are concerns about the ethics of this practice, as well as the practice's potential for harm. Although no research demonstrating the harms of conversion therapy with gender minority youth has been published, the potential harms of conversion therapy are suggested by clinicians' observations that the behavioral issues and psychological distress of many children and adolescents with gender dysphoria improves markedly when their gender identities and expressions are affirmed, not attempted to be converted. Through social and or medical transition, as well as the body of literature demonstrating negative effects of both rejection and lack of support on the health and well-being of... Okay, so... In conclusion... Uh, I'll read one more paragraph, because, you know, 
it's the end of the section, I might as well, even though you could probably read for this for a while. And in conclusion, given the lack of evidence for the efficacy, conversion therapy for the for the efficacy of conversion therapy, I think it meant to say, and the fact that conversion therapy efforts are based on a view of gender diversity that runs counter the scientific consensus, in addition to evidence that rejecting behaviors and the lack of support have adverse effects on the psychological well-being of gender minority youth, conversion therapy, as well as any therapeutic intervention with an a priori goal for a child or adolescent's gender expression, gender identity, or sexual orientation is inappropriate. Given the potential for harm associated with conversion therapy efforts, other affirmative behavioral health interventions are recommended for individual or family distress associated with sexual orientation and re related to us, gender identity. So I, I, had a, I had a moment that I wanted to refer to something. The anti-trans booklet, right? So they will say a couple times in here, that they are not trying to convince kids that it's wrong to go against gender norms. These people aren't actually so crazy that they're saying that, even though they do suck and their opinions are wrong. They will say, it's okay if a male child does stereotypically feminine things, but that doesn't make them trans. That's like the argument they're trying to put forward. They shouldn't be bullied for bucking gender norms. These people will actually say that despite putting out this anti-trans booklet. And I just wanted to state that for the record uh, after reading that bit, just to make sure that none of my opposition accuse me of mischaracterizing what they're saying in the booklet. However, what they are trying to do is do conversion therapy in the sense of convincing someone that they're not trans. And that, as stated by all the fucking research that I've been reading, it's not effective and potentially harmful. And obviously you could like, you could pull links to the end of the days. I think I have like four more of these. And then a throwback with our favorite grifter, Benny Shapiro. But um, let's just... Hopefully not read as much of these. Oh, good. It's behind a paywall. I don't have to. All right. We got another link from... What, is, what, what was this study? Current psychiatry reports. Providing affirmative care to transgender and gender diverse youth disparities, interventions, and outcomes. What's the summary? Providers can best support transgender youth by considering ways they can affirm these youth in their healthcare settings and helping them access support in schools. Understanding the intersection of multiple memory... And okay, so basically, it's just more examples of medical institutions that say the proper way to help these kids is to affirm them. <laughs> did, I, did I have two links to the same thing? Jesus. Anyway. <laughs> All right, so a PubMed. Young adult psychological outcome after puberty suppression and gender reassignment. And again, this is just like the... This is not the full text. This is like the summary. Uh, most of these you have to pay for the full text. But it's just giving you an idea that there's stuff out there to read explaining the evidence behind why gender affirming care is right and why conversion therapy is wrong. Um, and, you know, there could always be more data and information available. But uh, the way that this book tries to paint the situation on this issue is dishonest. And that's kind of the point. After gender reassignment in young adulthood, gender dysphoria was alleviated and psychological functioning was had steadily improved. Well-being was similar to or better than same age young adults from the general population. Improvements in psychological functioning were positively correlated with post-surgical subjective well-being. Now, the anti-trans booklet I noticed would say things like, oh, well, Right after transitioning, there is a honeymoon period, but then later on in light, they they're miserable again. Um, all the evidence that all this shit that I've read on this, which as you can see, it's been a lot, has indicated that that is not the case, and that you are going to make them even more miserable by trying to convince them they're not trans. So that is not the right answer to that question. Anyway, what is this? 
The mental health of transgender youth advances in understanding. Science Direct. All right. Gender-affirming medical therapy and supported social transition in childhood have been shown to correlate with improved psychological functioning for gender-variant children and adolescents. Recent research demonstrated increased rates of psychiatric morbidity among transgender youth compared to their peers. Okay, so obviously, um, suicide rate among transgender youth is still higher than, you know, the control, you know, cis population, which isn't good and is something to worry about, but... It is made better by gender affirming therapy, not worse, as the book Lit tries to argue. Um, I wanted to talk about this. I wanted to talk about conservatives misciting sources. So, if you all remember, because I do, I remember all of it. When Ben Shapiro got famous debating college kids who didn't know how to deal with it about trans people. And he was putting forth the argument that actually the research suggests that referring to trans people by their correct pronouns actually doesn't decrease their likelihood for suicide. He miscited the research, but let's watch a portion of the clip first. That's nonsense. The transgender suicide rate is 40%. It is 40%. It wasn't 40%. We'll get to that part too. And according to the, according to the Anderson School at UCLA, it makes no difference. They, there's a study that came out last year. It makes no difference, virtually no difference, statistically speaking, as to, as to whether people recognize you as a transgender person or not, which suggests there's a very high comorbidity between transgenderism, whatever that mental state may be, and suicidality. That has nothing to do with how society treats you. <laughs> In addition to this girl not being very good at arguing in general or advocating for her side in general, no hatred or anything, um, she obviously wasn't prepared for this. Um, when he said the transgender suicide rate is 40%, he was wrong. Uh, wh what he was trying to reference was that 41% uh, of a sample of transgender people reported having attempted suicide not completed not actually having killed themselves so to say that 40 when you say the rate of transgender people you know committing suicide is 40 percent you're making it sound like 40 percent of them actually kill themselves that's not really true he misunderstood the 40 percent figure it was from attempts and obviously if 40 percent of transgender people are attempting to kill themselves uh that is bad but it was just something that he misquoted, which isn't the main problem with what he was saying, because it's still a concerning number. He just, you know, he put the wrong words around it. But the, mo the more annoying part uh, was that when he was saying, oh, it makes no difference whether you recognize them as transgender, whether or not you treat them as transgender, whether or not you use the correct pronouns. When he was saying that, he was wrong. First of all, he meant the um, Williams Institute of US UCLA study, not the Anderson School of UCLA or uh, whatever he said. That was a misspeak. But secondly, when they were talking about recognition, they were talking about whether or not the transgender person was passing, whether or not they another person realized that they were trans, not whether or not they treated them with the proper pronouns, which completely changes the context around that, you know, around the statement and completely makes his argument completely moot lifetime suicide attempts were found to be lowest among respondents who said people cannot tell their transgender so if they were passing they were less likely to have distress uh to the point where they might want to commit suicide and if they were not passing if people could tell that they were trans and could tell that you know um they had they were trying to transition and that they were assigned a different sex at birth that caused them distress for obvious reasons and made them more likely to be able to kill themselves so ben shapiro got this information completely fucking wrong and you know what he is a relatively smart guy of uh, uh you know apart from you know saying shit that's wrong all the time so whether or not he knew he was misquoting that study or not is anyone's guess. 
This is from the study that Ben Shapiro was citing. The why am why don't I just pull it up here? Or that he was attempting this citing, but he said the wrong thing. The Williams Institute of UCLA. So he conveniently leaves out all the parts in the study that are like pro trans, because of course he does. Because why wouldn't he? He has motivated reasoning. Let me read it from the article instead of just my fucking screenshot of it. In particular, detransitioning is associated with a higher risk of suicide thoughts and attempts compared to those who are living their lives according to their gender identity and those who have not yet begun to, signaling that detransitioning is a uniquely stressful experience for transgender people. Furthermore, the cumulative effect of experiencing multiple minority stressors dramatically increases serious psychological distress and suicidality so think about this and this is how annoying these fucking people are and this is why i fucking hate ben shapiro and you know i love my friend but i had a fucking old friend from high school who i love dearly who you know quoted this ben shapiro study to me uh <laughs> to, as as proof and then you know i read it and then got into an argument with him about it later that he didn't respond to and then he removed me from social media at some point <laughs> anyway that's besides the point uh, the fucking study is not a study where they're like, oh yeah, affirming trans people, man, it's a bad thing. It doesn't help them at all. It's saying the literal opposite, but he picks the parts that he thinks he can represent in a twist in a certain way so that he can make an argument to a stupid college kid on a fucking campus that makes himself fucking look good and then gets some fucking international fame. Fucking his own fucking show a few years, uh, some years later, The Daily Wire, where he makes all this money and has all this fucking reputation and respect as a debate, bro. And the thing he was citing didn't fucking agree with him. I'm pretty sure, and I couldn't find evidence of this because I really wanted to, but. I, I heard somewhere that the actual researchers behind this study he miscited came out and said that dumb fuck uh, did not cite my the information in my study correctly. Uh, he pulled out a part out of context that wasn't actually saying what he tried to make it say. Uh, and he was fucking wrong. I couldn't find the example of that. But I'm pretty sure that's something that's happened. But, you know. So... And also, when we get to the parts in the booklet later on that talk about detransitioners, obviously this flies in the face of it. People who detransition actually sometimes see issues. And to be clear, there are probably people who detransition because transitioning might have legitimately not been the correct answer for them. There are probably examples of that legitimately happening, but that does not mean that we throw out all gender affirming care and all gender affirming surgeries for all trans people. That's not the answer. That doesn't make any sense. There are some people who need it. In fact, the people who detransition are in the minority. Again, despite what the booklet's going to try to claim later. Whew. Where am I? I'm going here. Can I just like throw this at the end so I can look at it later instead of having to scroll by it every time? All right. Sorry for the asthma. I went for a run earlier and I'm literally too fucking stubborn to just use my fucking inhaler. As stupid as that sounds. Alright. Talking about these two little factoids. <clears throat> Studies show that 100% of children who use puberty blockers will go on to use crock sex hormones, take, uh, you know, have hormone therapy, leaving them permanently sterile. And then the long-term effects of puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones have not been studied. Right. So right off the bat, the first thing they're not telling you here, while it's true that there could be more studies and more data around this, uh, that would be helpful. Fucking puberty blockers have been used for fucking 30 years. They're trying to make it sound like it's this new thing. People are just trying recently as the transgender trend has come around and, you know, we're just flying out of the gate with all these crazy new treatments. We have no idea if it's going to work, but we're just, you know, we're ad-libbing, we're improv we're making up as we go along. It's, they've been using it for 30 fucking years, mate. Since, you know, before half of you people even knew trans people existed. Fuck, before I, I think I learned about trans people in fucking 2014. Before, before I even knew about fucking trans people, I think I learned for, the first time I, like, learned about trans people was when I learned that, um, an individual 
that I went to college with, who I think goes by, I don't know why, I think goes by Samson now, that they were trans. And I was like, oh, because someone referred to them as they, and I got confused. And then I looked into, oh, they're trans. What is trans? Oh, that's what that is. Okay. I don't know why I'm rambling on this anecdote right now. But anyway, besides the point, puberty, block puberty blockers been used for 30 fucking years. Uh, there needs to be more data around it. But right now, the findings are that, you know, there are no long-term effects. It is not known whether or not it might have an effect on bone density later. That is something that they will say. But there's no evidence that there are any long-term effects. And they've been used for a long time. In order for us to know the answer to this question, we just need to wait for the people who have used puberty blockers in the past to basically get old and geriatric. That's what we're waiting for. Until then, we won't know. That's basically my understanding from what I've read. Anyway. Is this their source or is this mine? Because this is their source. Because I, re I recognize the fucking icon of Transgender Trend. I assume because I have this here that this means that this is their source. Let me just make sure. Puberty suppression in 710. Okay, this is their source. This is their source for the all children who use puberty blockers go on to use cross sex hormones, leaving them sterile. Let's read the results and conclusion, I guess, of their source. This is the source from the anti trans booklet. Behavioral and emotional problems and depressive symptoms decreased even in their own study. Anyway, excuse me. Let's finish before we start making fun. While general functioning improved significantly during puberty suppression. <laughs> why would you... You know why they source... You know why they source articles that literally go against things that they say? It's because fucking old, concerned, conservative parents who are reading this fucking booklet aren't going in checking the fucking URLs of the sources. And the fucking old people they're targeting aren't downloading the fucking digital version of the booklet either. Anyway... Let me let me stop ranting for once. <laughs> I fucking hate these people so much, dude. It's funny because all these fucking conservative groups in town that I fight with, they're like, oh, he must be like in league. He must be conspiring. Like the fucking chairman of the town council brought him in uh, to fucking attack the conservatives. Like, no, I'm doing it because I fucking hate all of you. Anyway, this <laughs> is besides the point. Let's go. Behavioral and emotional problems and depressive symptoms decreased while general functioning improved significantly during puberty suppression. Feelings of anxiety and anger did not change between T0 and T1. Okay. While changes over time were equal for both sexes, compared with natal males, natal females were older. Why can't you just say females at birth or... I guess, I guess the term works. Anyway, were older when they started puberty suppression and showed more problem behavior at both T0 and T1. Gender dysphoria and body satisfaction did not change between T0 and T1. No adolescent withdrew from puberty suppression and all started cross-sex hormone treatment, the first step of, the actual, of actual gender reassignment. Puberty suppression may be considered a valuable contribution in the clinical management of gender dysphoria in adolescents. So, let's think about this. You're writing a booklet, an anti-trans booklet, for the Heritage Foundation, right? And you want a snappy, in-your-face, surprising, shocking data figure to throw in a cute little fucking square on a fucking cute little grid on a colorful little page or your fucking booklet. So, so what do you do? Well, here's what you do. You go to this study that is literally telling you puberty suppression is a valuable contribution to the management of gender dysphoria. Oh, some anxiety and depressive symptoms decreased. There might have been other behavioral problems. And you take the part where they said, oh, they all started cross-sex hormone treatment after uh, puberty suppression. And you make a fucking link to that source and go, oh my god. 100% of children who use puberty blockers will go out and use cross-sex hormones. <laughs> and then throw in the part uh, about them being permanently sterile. That wasn't even referred to. I don't believe. Maybe it was in the full text. I don't think these assholes bought the full text. Like, I don't think they paid for the full PDF. I'll just... 
I'll throw that as fucking general speculation. This is what these people fucking do. To be clear on the sterilization part. You know. If you're changing your sex at birth. And you're like. Eventually. If you're taking hormones. It does come with the risk. It is true that it comes with the risk of being sterile. The, the thing is. The people taking these treatments know that. And they're okay with that. Because the dysphoria is worse. Having the dysphoria is worse. Wanting to kill themselves is worse. So they're like, fuck it. I don't want kids. I just want to feel normal. That's the that's the thing with this. And you know, you could bring up an argument if you're on the opposition to say, oh, well, they're kids. They don't understand the, you know, the consequences of such a momentous decision that has, you know, where you won't be able to have kids later on. It, and that's one thing. But, you know, if the alternative is that the dysphoria is so bad that they fucking have depression and, you know, suicidal thoughts. And if they don't want kids anyway, I feel like, for them, it's probably a small fucking price to pay. Don't you think? Also, um, what I hear actual fucking medical professionals say, not these idiots, is that it's not, they're all permanently sterile. It's that there's, like, a major risk of them becoming sterile. So, that's them. Obviously, if you're fucking, you know, a trans woman, you're not going to be having kids. Let me get clear. But, like, I think they're talking for, like, the... For the men. Like, you know. If they go on hormone therapy and then they stop later. And they decide, I don't want to be a trans woman. I actually do want to be a man. Uh, if they went on those hormone treatments, they might be sterile. Um, there's a risk that they will become sterile. So, to be clear, so that no one says dumb shit. And then they have another source. Their source for the long-term effects of puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones have not been studied. Their source is from Transgender Trend, which is obviously an anti-trans website. Which doesn't mean the information in here is wrong. Uh, on principle, I'm just pointing it out uh, for clarity's sake. This article is about how the NHS, so like the British, I think it's the British health organization, the public organization run by the government, their website on gender dysphoria was changed. And they're like, oh, they took out the claim that puberty blockers are considered to be fully reversible. And then uh, they add a language where they admitted that the long-term effects are unknown. And then you read, and I, I checked that these were the, actually the changes on the NHS website, by the way. So, these are actually the, uh, th this is actually the new page on gender dysphoria. This is actually what it says. They didn't like sneak in anything here. Little, little is known about the long-term side effects of hormone and puberty blockers in children with gender dysphoria. Although the Gender Identity Development Service advises this is a physically reversible treatment if stopped, it is not known that the psychological effects may be. Okay, so there might be psychological effects, not physical effects. So... There's that. It's also not known whether hormone blockers affect the development of the teenage brain or children's bones. This is, The bone thing is something I've seen um, medical organizations refer to. Side effects may also include hot flushes, fatigue, and mood, uh, mood alterations. So, this is what they're referring to when they say that. But note that they're, they're calling it an admission uh oh it's you say it was fully reversible but now you admit it's not well they say uh, right now uh the prevailing medical knowledge that it is reversible they're just saying that there might be long-term side effects that they don't know about uh which they need to wait for the people who have used pu puberty blockers for the last 30 years to get old so that they can know that's what they are saying so they're trying to make a big fuss about that and they're trying to exaggerate that as much as possible so that parents are afraid to put their kids on puberty blockers if they have gender dysphoria. That's their goal by doing that. Now this is PHSA, Provincial Health Services Authority. 
There are no known irreversible effects of puberty blockers. If you decide to stop taking them, your body will go through puberty just the way it would have if you are not taking puberty blockers at all. Oh, and I should, I should have just like explained what puberty blockers are for people who haven't spent, you know, the last few days just reading a bunch of shit about this or who aren't trans and don't know. So puberty blockers, they, they're the step that you take for gender affirming care just as you're hitting puberty, it comes after you've done the social stuff where you changed your name and you've changed the way you dress and you are either more masculine, more feminine, and you have different pronouns and you do that for a while to see if it's working for you. The next step is if you once you hit puberty, once you get a little bit older, if when you're hitting puberty, you take puberty blockers because if you're a trans woman, and you have dysphoria, you don't feel comfortable in your, you know, male at birth body, going through puberty is going to be really shitty for you. So what they do is they put you on puberty blockers to pause the, you know, the rush of hormones and everything associated with puberty uh, and those changes. And it puts it on pause. And when you stop taking the puberty blockers, puberty will resume as normal. So that's what puberty blockers do. I'm sure we'll come across their scientific name. G something 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 analogs as we go through here. Oh, wait. Hold on. Let's go through risks of blah, blah, blah. Puberty blockers are considered to be very safe overall. We are not sure if puberty blockers have negative side effects on bone development and height. By, this is not people aren't hiding this conservatives are like oh no they won't tell you the risk they they will especially if you are the person or the parent of the person who is going to get these treatments they fucking tell you no one's hiding this y'all are just fucking too stupid to fucking read and listen anyway research so far shows that the effects are minimal however we won't know the long-term effects until the first people to take puberty blockers get older that's what i was referring to earlier I actually meant to read this. I'm glad I went back instead of just closing it and moving on. If you have penis tissue and you think you might eventually want to have a vaginoplasty, talk with your primary care provider. Blah, 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 more information. Okay, this isn't really relevant to what I want to talk about. Risks of withholding puberty blockers. Healthcare providers refusing to provide puberty blockers to youth can cause additional distress and may lead to anxiety and depression and suicide. Withholding puberty blockers and hormone therapy is not a neutral option. Not a neutral option. It can result in increased risk of mental health issues. This is absolutely true. What's the saying I want to say right now? The absence of action is itself action. Inaction is action. Just because you decide to not treat someone doesn't mean you are doing something neutral. You are, Especially if you are actively harming them. So... The, these this conservative booklet trying to warn you don't give them puberty blockers uh yo oh there might be some scary long-term side effects you don't know about they're not doing they're not doing a neutral action they're doing a harm uh it's not a neutral decision refusing to do anything to help your child is not being cautious or being neutral you are harming them there is that All right moving on to the next thing Puberty blockers across sex hormones. This is where I wanted to be on the page, right? Puberty blockers. Gonadotrophin releasing hormone analogs. Wow, good one. I'm sure I butchered that pronunciation. Pause the physical changes of puberty, such as breast development or facial hair. Little is known about the long-term side effects of hormone or puberty blockers and children gender dysphoria. Although GIDS advises this is a physically reversible treatment, if stopped, it is not known what the psychological effects may be. I think the psychological effects of untreated gender dysphoria might be a little bit greater, though. But I'm not saying we shouldn't look into these either. Or to long-term side effects, I'm just pointing out that conservatives trying to grab onto this sentence to use it to say you shouldn't do it are idiots and fucking can't read and are illiterate. Anyway. It's also not known whether hormone blockers affect the development of the teenage brain or children's bones. Side effects may also include hot flushes, fatigue, and mood alterations. All of those sound not as bad as crippling depression, but, you know, take it as you will.
cross-sex hormones do cause irreversible changes such as breast development or the breaking or deepening of the voice. So puberty blockers are irreversible as we know now and don't have any known long-term side effects. But it is true that hormone therapy, cross-sex hormones, the thing that comes after puberty blockers, those do have risks, absolutely. I think one of them is cardiovascular health related. And they do have side effects. So there is that. So I don't know why the conservative the conservatives focus on that too, but I don't know why they I know why they do it. They want to hit the issue on all fronts, but that's such more of a, you know, valid thing to complain about than the puberty blockers, which are reversible and have basically no side effects. Anyway. What happened? And then this is. Oh wait, did I even did I even mention what that was from? I didn't. Let, let's actually go. This, oh, this is from the fucking NHS <laughs> from the UK. This is the. <coughs> this is the thing that the transgender trend website. This is uh. This is the page that they were literally flipping out. They're admitting. They're admitting the, they don't know the long term effects. You you read the page. You saw what they actually said. Um. The transgender trend website focused on the one part of that page that they thought made their argument look good. And the rest of it, they conveniently ignored. Anyway, Mayo Clinic. I don't think water is going to stop me from losing my voice tonight. What happens when pubertal blockers are stopped? The use of GnRH. I can say that. Analogs pauses puberty. Providing time to determine if a child's gender identity is long-lasting. And this is the thing, too. The conservative people complain, Oh, the child might change their mind. The child might change their mind. But they're against puberty blockers. The whole point of the puberty blockers is to make sure that the kid is actually trans and that the dysphoria is not something they're going to grow out of before you take long-term treatments that have, you know, long-term effects. The whole point of puberty blockers is to be cautious and not just fucking give them the crazy out there treatments right away. But they're against it. You know why? Because they're fucking idiots. That's the reason. And they don't know anything about these treatments. Anyway. Rant over. It also gives children and their families time to think about or plan for the psychological, medical, developmental, social, and legal issues ahead. If an adolescent child... Isn't it so much nicer just reading from, like, boring mainstream medical organizations rather than stupid fucking propaganda booklets? Anyway, if an adolescent child decides to stop taking GnRH analogs, puberty will resume and the normal progression to of the physical and emotional changes of puberty will continue. That's from Mayo Clinic. Is this more about fucking... Alright, so this is something that they source desisting persisting gender dysphoria after childhood oh so they referred to new atlantis and new atlantis refers to this study all this study says is that for the people who both continued with and did not continue with gender affirming care for the people who quote unquote grew out of their gender dysphoria and for the people who did not the years the period between 10 and 13 years was crucial they cited it and said, as noted earlier, there is some evidence that cross-gender identification becomes more persistent if it lasts into adolescence. All right, but if that's the case, then what's your answer for the people for whom it lasts into adolescence? Sounds like they need all these treatments. How am I supposed to take this as evidence against giving these treatments to these kids. That's not much of an argument. Unless, and again, this is what they try to push. They try to push the idea that, oh, wow, the only reason why it's persisting into adolescence is because it's the tr everyone's um, enabling them and affirming them, and that pushes them to being trans. But there's all the evidence in the world that that is not true. If we haven't gotten to that part yet, we will. They talk about the gender. The definitions have been used both in the past and are currently used around gender issues, etc. 
they talk about you know gender what time was used as synonym for sex now people in the gender ideology they keep calling it an ideology i mean by the same logic you know they're the anti-trans ideology everyone has an ideology but they're trying to say it in a way that makes us sound like we're in a rational like religious cult that just really wants people to switch genders for no other reason other than like it's our main thing it's not because of any like scientific research or anything which is funny because they're the literally the religious people who have a problem with trans people but it's whatever it's really cute but it's projection at its finest anyway they talk about oh well they're using it as a way to refer to you know gender in a way that's separate from bodily sex and then they give a generally fine summary of i guess their opposition's view of what the word gender means and that's great all right gender dysphoria refers to the distress induced by a strong desire to identify as something other than one's sex preferring the typical dress and social activities of the opposite sex or having a desire to change one's body to appear to be the opposite sex transition those who struggle with gender dysphoria should be aided by therapies that guide an individual to explore root causes of their distress and <laughs> what if the root cause of their distress is dysphoria mate <laughs> and a healthy acceptance of their sex so here they give their solution. Well, listen, those ideologues over there, those crazy, you know, pro LGBT people, their solution is gender affirming care. All those dumb medical organizations, their their solution is gender affirming care. Here's our solution. Here's all our the alternative that we're offering you. We can give you therapy to explore root causes of your distress and accept your sex. So. You'll notice how vague and non-specific it is, and that's because they have no alternative solution. Uh, they they vaguely refer to you have to find the root cause of your problem, despite the fact that dysphoria is the root cause. And they'd say we just want to get you to accept your biological sex. This is conversion therapy. They won't use the term. I think it's mostly a term that people use to attack them with. Uh, I don't think you know they ever came up with the term, but it is what it is. That is conversion therapy that they are offering. That is what they think trans people should do, despite all the information out there to suggest that trying to push that has a potential to cause harm, as we read in all those other stories, studies before that we're not going to go back and reread because we have so much to get through. And despite the fact that affirming care helps. All right. There was uh, another part I wanted to get to, but it's not in here. Although you can read all this if you want. Oh, it's very interesting. They refer to intersex people, uh, which is in a very, 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 very rare condition uh, where you actually have the wrong chromosome. Or not, excuse me. That you have uh, your sexual anatomy inconsistent with your chromosomes. And your sexual anatomy is not clearly male or female. So they do, I guess credit where credit is due, a fine job of pointing to edge cases where biological sex itself, not even gender, is actually not black and white. But correctly identify that this is a very, very rare condition that is unrelated to the issue, which it is. Anyway, but I guess... As much as I hate these people, uh, fair play to them for even doing the due diligence of referring to the edge case. So there you go. And then they have a frequently asked questions page. Is sex assigned at birth? No. Sex is determined at conception. <laughs> when people say sex assigned at birth, they're not disputing the fact that your chromosomes are determined at contraception that's not the point of saying that i think that this is a this is them trying to i feel like this is trying to sneak in some moral shit about abortion in here uh as an unrelated thing uh i i could be just trying to psychoanalyze them too much but i think that's why they stuck that in there like yes 
we understand your chromosomes are there at conception too. Like no one's disputing that, but I, I think they're doing that for like anti-abortion reasons, but I don't know. When the sperm carrying X or Y chromosome unites with the egg, which has an X chromosome. Nice little lesson there. You can recognize sex during prenatal testing. I mean, I feel as if they're trying to make it sound like their opposition disagrees with them about this, but no one does. So there, there you go. And then let's look at question number three. It is possible to have, is it possible to have a female brain in a male body or vice versa? And they very confidently and smugly say no. Sex is not defined by the brain, but by the body's reproductive class. Well, when we're talking about female brain in a male body, we're not talking about the sex of the brain. And there is some preliminary research we're going to get to in a second, but I want to kind of lay the groundwork for it first. Anyway, they very smugly and very confidently say no. Sex is not defined by the brain, but by the body's reproductive class. The brain itself is comprised of brain cells that have either male or female chromosomes, and they, uh, they cannot possibly oversee the development of a body that is the opposite sex. They're, they very stupidly miss the point when they think that when people talk about female brain and the male body, that they're talking about the chromosomes in the brain. That's not what's being referred to, nor are we referring to the sex of the brain, but we'll get to that in one more second. Notice how confident and smug they are in their answer here. They're sure that, they're sure that it's not possible. And then let's skip a few pages just to read this segment here in chapter three, where they again try to push the idea that's a trend, the rapid onset, gender dysphoria, blah, blah, blah. Let's read this. Though it is scientifically impossible for someone to have been born in the wrong body. Again, notice how smug and confident they are. It's not possible. It could it possibly be that someone might have gender dysphoria for valid reasons. It has to be made up. It just has to be that they're mentally ill and, you know, we have to we have to treat them by making them accept their sex. Wouldn't it be so fucking awkward? Wouldn't you feel so fucking stupid if it turned out that that wasn't true? If it turned out that there was actually we learned something about the brain like 5 or 10 years ago now that explained transgender people and explained gender dysphoria. Wouldn't that make you feel like a fucking idiot? What I'm about to show you is, from what I understand, preliminary research. So, you know, the pro-trans people on my side, we can't start running victory laps right now. Uh, we can't, you know, take this all the way to the bank and run with it yet. So, let's read. Transgender people report discomfort with their birth sex and a strong identification with the opposite sex. The current study was designed to shed further light on the question of whether the brains of transgender people resemble their birth sex or their gender identity. Again, it's not talking about the chromosomes. For this purpose, we analyzed a sample of 24 cis men, 24 cis women, and 24 trans women before gender-affirming hormone therapy. So to be clear, this is before any of the trans women involved were taking hormones in order to transition to the opposite sex. So that's not the reason why the brains are shifted in that direction. We employed a recently developed multivariate classifier that yields a continuous probabilis blah, 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 probabilistic rather than a binary estimate for brains to be male or female. The brains of transgender women range between cisgender men and cisgender women, albeit still closer to cisgender men, so there is that, and the differences to both cisgender men and the cisgender women were significant. These findings add support to the notion that the underlying brain anatomy in trans people is shifted away from their biological sex towards their gender identity. And obviously, this isn't talking about chromosomes. Don't be fucking stupid. This is talking about a number of variables within the brain and a number of ways to classify brains that probably, you know, involve brain structures and attributes of the brain that are too complicated for you or I to have a comprehensive understanding of. But that people with gender dysphoria that they added in their study alongside like a cis control group 
had brains that seemed to be shifted in their structure towards that of the gender identity that they felt more comfortable identifying as. So I'm not saying that this is the fucking silver bullet, fucking 100% evidence that being trans can be physically found in the brain and that there is like a biological reason why people are trans. I'm just saying with how fucking smug these fucking idiot ideologues are, these fucking insecure fucking people who are so fucking ass mad that people in schools are identifying as transgender, that they have to make a federal case about it. And their religion, their religious ideals are so offended by it that they have to make out with strong statements. Oh, sex is, uh, sex is not defined by the brain. Oh, it definitely isn't, guys. Oh, it's scientifically impossible, guys, for it possible to have been born in the wrong body. Don't you respect the science? You couldn't possibly know that. And it is possible that we will learn in five or ten years that shit like this was on absolutely on the right track. And as we learn more about the brain, which we know depressingly little about at this time, we find out the reasons why people have gender dysphoria and everything becomes more clear. Wouldn't you feel like a fucking asshole? If you acted so smug and sure of yourself saying this dumbass shit, only to have it come out later that there was a reason why people were trans the whole time. I mean... And the problem, obviously, is that they state it's scientifically impossible without having a way to prove or know that. That's the problem, to be clear. But to be honest with you, even if in 5 or 10 years... All the evidence in the world comes out proving that transgender people are transgender for a reason. That we can point to attributes in the brain that make it so. These people would just say it was all fake anyway. They wouldn't fucking care. They would keep doing their stupid fucking advocacy campaigns. Assuming they don't all die out of old age before that happens. Because half of them probably will. <laughs> anyway. Let's go down to number 9. Oh great. The fucking bathroom shit. Hold on, let me take a fucking drink before this one. Do mixed sex changing rooms increase the likelihood of sexual offenses? Yes. Oh, wow. What evidence do they have for this, I wonder? This was fucking annoying. Anyone can take advantage of mixed sex policies. Literally anyone. Mm -mm. A 2018 study showed that there were three times more voyeurism offenses in Target retail stores. Sorry, it's serious. Very serious issue. After the public announcement of their mixed sex restroom and fitting room policy. Furthermore, a UK investigative report found that almost 90% of reported sexual assaults, harassment, and voyeurism in swimming pool and sports center changing rooms take place in mixed sex facilities. Of 134... Reported incidents that include voyeurism, harassment, sexual assault, and rape. 120 were committed in mixed sex spaces. Sex segregated changing rooms exist to protect women from assault and sexual crime, but safety is not the only reason. So, all right, well, let's look at what they're talking about. This is the study that they refer to. And by the way, it was done... Not that, not that I'm saying this just to immediately dismiss all the information in here as inherently false, but it was done by an anti-trans organization called... Oh, here it is. Women means something. It was staring me in the face the entire fucking time. Shows that voyeurism-related offenses increased significantly after publication of tar Target's policy. Doubling or tripling according to all measures, while other sexual offense categories change little. Findings are consistent with the sex predator theory which has posted posited that sexual offenders may use gender identity policy in private spaces to gain access to women and children in order to perpetuate sexual violence. The study is the first longitudinal analysis, is that what it is, of risks related to gender inclusion policies. Key findings, sexual incidents increased across the entire time frame with 44 incidents in the four pre-policy trimesters and 80 in the four post-policy trimesters. Wow. Significant increase from 44 to 88. Now that's 36 additional incidents. 
across a year and a half, was it? Hold on. No, across a, a year. So comparing the year before to the year prior, there were 36 additional incidents across the entire year. But wait, at one store? No. It seems like it's at all stores. So this is an increase of 36 incidents across an entire year across nearly 2,000 stores. So that's 0.018 more incidents per store. The idea that they call this a significant increase is a fucking joke. This is very weak evidence. And the reason why it's weak evidence is because they don't have any other evidence. This is the best that they have. If they had more compelling evidence, they would be showing it. Which goes to show you that they don't have any. And also... The most annoying part of this all, all perpetrators were male. None of them were fucking trans people, like a, trying to fucking abuse these spaces to fucking assault people. An increase of 36 incidents across a year, across 2,000 stores, is not exactly compelling fucking information. This is to... This is even despite the fact, obviously, correlation versus causation is an increase across an entire year, across 2,000 stores, of 36 additional incidents. Was that caused by this policy, or are there other factors that are involved? Correlation does not necessarily mean causation. How do you know that this increase of incidents is because of the policy? It doesn't seem like you do. While it is possible that a general rise in voyeuristic sexual offenses relative to other offenses may account for some of this increase, which by the way, was 36 incidents. That was the increase. The magnitude and precise timing of the increase suggests that Target's gender inclusion policy accounts for the bulk of it. You don't have any basis to say that. <laughs> this one data point doesn't prove that. If you could reproduce this over and over again at other stores that are adding these policies, that would be one thing. But despite the fact that like non-binary restrooms and changing rooms are becoming more normal, I'm not seeing that. And now we get to one of my links. Gender identity, non-discrimination laws, and public accommodations. A review of evidence regarding safety and privacy in public restrooms, locker rooms, and changing rooms. This was done by Sexuality Research and Social Policy. Nice. All right. The study finds that reports of privacy and safety violations, public restrooms, locker rooms, and changing rooms are exceedingly rare, which is why you're pulling from like an increase of 36 in that one study that they were so impressed by. This study provides evidence that fears of increased safety and privacy violations as a result of non-discrimination laws are not empirically grounded. They took their data from... Let's see. Analyses of localities in Massachusetts with and without gender identity, inclusive pu public accommodation, non-discrimination ordinances. So think about that. The other study just took Target stores, which had the policy and said, oh, wow, ooh, the number of offenses went up by 36. That must mean it was caused by the policy. This is actual fucking science where they actually had a fucking control group. Imagine that. Where they compared localities that had these policies, the gender inclusive policies, and those that did not. Imagine doing actual science. I didn't even think about that uh, think about talking about that when going over why I thought that one study was shit. They literally just looked at the fucking target stores. Saw an increase and said, "Well, <laughs> must have been because of the gender inclusive policies." I guess it's possible that a general rise in these sexual offenses relative to other offenses might have accounted for the increase, but I don't know, guys. I kind of think it was because of the gender increase policy. But actual fucking organizations that actually know how to do a fucking study that aren't just a fucking, you know, a anti-trans fucking website that has fucking motivation to get the result that they want has a control group. Let's look at, you know, localities, stores, whatever, that 
have things like non-binary restrooms or you know gender identity accommodations let's look at those that have and those that haven't so we could actually compare them so we could account for factors like that so who am i gonna believe and to be clear even if they had a control group the idea that they called an increase of 36 significant makes them really hard to take seriously moving on and I don't think you can just get a copy of the study, which is unfortunate because I would rather go through it than just read fucking summaries and headlines. However, anecdotal data, so I guess take that in mind when you read this. And small studies suggest that transgender populations are at heightened risk of cr criminal victimization. Basically, uh, in this study, they're talking about both sexual assault and just like assault, assault, like someone like coming up and punching you or attacking you in general. The annoying part about conservatives complaining or fear mongering that tr laying trans people in the restrooms is going to cause them to like sexually harass people or that cis men are just going to pretend to be trans so that they can sexually harass women. It's all bullshit. And also, usually what actually is happening is that trans people are the victims of like sexual assault and assault way more often than cis people. So while you're fear-mongering about them so that they can't use the restroom identifying with their sex, they're actually the victims of the very problems you're fear-mongering about because they're being sexually harassed, etc., etc. It's just... Um, it's just an annoying fucking, like, cherry on top of the conservative, you know, shitty messaging around this that gets really fucking annoying. How are transgender identities diagnosed? Transgender status is self-declared. There is no scan or test that a medical professional can administer which can diagnose or even observe a gender identity. So this is partially true and partially bullshit. The, obviously, you can't scan a person and go, Oh, you have trans brain. We figured it out, guys. It doesn't work like that. However, there are. it's not like there aren't criteria for determining who has gender dysphoria and who does not. Anyone who tells you that there's no way to figure out whether someone's trans... Or to diagnose gender dysphoria, they're fucking lying. They're full of shit. They don't know what the fuck they're talking about. They're fucking morons. In the DSM-5, there is <coughs> an entry for gender dysphoria. There are symptoms. There is a criteria for diagnosing these people. Here, criteria, gender dysphoria in adolescents and adults. Here's the criteria for, you know, diagnosing gender dysphoria. When these people try to insinuate, oh, it's just... It's just like the child says to the trans and then no work is done after that. It's all just done off of, you know, people saying that way they feel. It's not true. It's not how it works. In fact, and I'm not like I'll, gender dysphoria is a mental ailment. Being trans is not a mental illness. Be, make To make myself clear before I say this. For any like mental like issue or mental health issue or mental disorder or whatever, it's never going to be the point where they scan your brain like if they scan my brain oh well, john's autistic guys we figured it out it's doing fucking diagnoses of mental health shit is obviously going to be more complicated than scanning the brain or doing a medical test obviously but that's not an argument against anything so this is a stupid fucking point meant for gullible conservative parents to gobble up in order to you know, get them on the line of, oh, all the transgender stuff is bull sh sh bullshit, you know, made up nonsense. That's what they're going for here. Our kids having transgender surgery. Very scientific term there. Yes, minors are increasingly approved for gender reassignment surgeries. Girls as young as 13 have undergone cosmetic double mastectomies and they're attempted pure male. And popular media like TLC, I am jazz. I don't care about popular media. Have all highlighted boys under the age of 18 who have gone through full genital gender reassignment surgeries. So it is true that girls will get, you know, top surgery, chest surgery much earlier than the other surgeries are given. But when people, for instance, say shit like, young kids are having bottom surgery or they're having their private parts chopped off that's not true um for politifact we found no examples of young kids receiving transition related surgery the florida department of health differentiates between children under 10 and adolescents between 10 and 18 
DeSantis' office provided PolitiFact with two cases involving adolescents when asked to provide examples of this happening. So if you hear this, this is a blatant lie. With this, it's misleading if a parent reads this and thinks it means like bottom surgery, like actually having like, like you know, genital, you know, reassignment surgery uh, at a young age. Um, the boys under 18 that they're referring to, I think were like 17. We can look into that, but it's not recommended for uh, boys under the age of 18 to get bottom surgery. So those cases, they probably should have waited until they were 18 to do bottom surgery. That probably would have been better because that is what the mainstream medical guidelines say. It's like the way it goes is when they're really young, it's social shit like the way you dress and the way you name yourself and pronouns and all of that. When you start to hit puberty, it's things like puberty blockers to make sure that you're actually trans and that, you, you know, you're experiencing gender dysphoria so that we can be sure before we give you the more long lasting, riskier treatments. Uh, after a certain age, they start giving you the, you know, later on in puberty, they start saying, okay, you need the gender affirming surgery. This is gender dysphoria. You are trans. We're going to give you the hormone replacement theory. All right, theory. <laughs> Jesus. Now I sound like them. Hormone replacement therapy. The more long-lasting shit. And then after 18, you're supposed to get the bottom surgery, the actual, like, transition surgery where, you know, your genitals are changed. For the girls with the chest surgery, that is earlier on, before 18. But not the bottom surgery. Do children who want to be the opposite sex grow out of it? Yes. We've already read the information that suggests otherwise, but let's read what they said. According to all 11 published studies on this question, there's only 11 guys. Most young children who are diagnosed with gender dysphoria will not have that desire as adults if they are not given medical interventions such as puberty blockers and if they're not socially transitioned. So apparently... <laughs> If you don't, if you try to do conversion therapy on them, they argue you will, uh, and if you try to convince them instead of giving them puberty blockers and give them gender affirming treatment, uh, if you do all of that, oh, they'll eventually grow out of it. That's what they're claiming. And they won't seek medical transition as adults. And then they say, though there are few studies on this new presentation, there is increasing evidence of regret among teens, who under among teens who underwent medical transition. That's not true either. Let's go through some shit. Oh, by the way, I fucking hate them. I guess I can't blame them for, for this. I don't know if this source went down before or after they listed it. The source they listed for this all this fucking dog shit here Literally, when I try to open it, my fucking antivirus pipes up. So, uh, I don't think highly enough of these people to fucking bring my antivirus down to read their source. So, I'm just going to go into, well, I'm just going to refer back to, actually, all the stuff we read previous that we're not going back to right now. You can go back earlier in the video. That debunked the idea that kids grow out of it. When, you know, they have gender dysphoria young. Uh, that's the minority. The majority of them don't grow out of it. And as far as the evidence of regret among teens who underwent medical transition, that also is not true. Also, per the articles we read, you know, a couple hours ago when debunking another claim that these people made. The vast majority of the group still identified with their new gender five years later, according to the study. And many have begun hormonal medications in adolescence to prompt biological changes to align with their gender identities. Doesn't medical transition help transgender identified people? Short-term studies show that many transgender people, I'm not reading their long fucking made-up term, experience a brief honeymoon period of satisfaction after transitioning. But this result doesn't last. Long-term studies paint a different picture of the effects of transitioning demonstrating that, in many cases, quality of life deteriorates significantly and suicide rates rise. A recent large cohort study, which tracked nearly 4,000 transgender adults, received hormone therapy for an average of eight years, found that women's risk of heart attack tripled while men's risk of developing venous thrombolism became five times greater. 
The full extent of the medical harms of hormonal treatments prescribed for lifetime usage will not be realized for many years. The best quality studies show that transitioning leads to negative outcomes. So to be clear on this, uh, carva- cardiovascular risks are real. Um, so there's not denying that. However, the brief honeymoon period of satisfaction and the idea that uh, they were good at later, not true. And suicide rates rising after that honeymoon period, also not demonstrated. So is this their link? The, the, annoying, the annoying thing here. So in order to back up their claim that the full extent of the medical harms of hormonal treatments prescribed for lifetime usage will not be realized for many years. Well, what's their source on that? Well, their source on that is their own fucking petition. The Kelsey Coalition, which is involved in making this fucking book. First of all, it's a petition, not a scientific paper, you fucking idiots. Anyway, saying literally the same thing. The full extent of the medical harms and more and treatments prescribed for lifetime usage will not be realized for many years. They, they're like quoting their own petition and citing it as a source. Using a petition as a source already doesn't make any sense. It's just more funny that they're like... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they're citing their own petition that they wrote as a source of information for this claim that they are making about hormonal treatments. <laughs> and when you go to like the Kelsey Coalition site, you get to a fucking link of this guide. <laughs> oh, man. You love to see it. Here's the other link that they had in regards to this paragraph where they say the best quality studies show that transitioning leads to negative outcomes. Treatment for this particular disorder is severe. Lifelong <clears throat> experimental medicalization, sterilization, and complete removal of healthy body parts. Not loading it morally at all, by the way. Very objective way of describing um, genital surgery. Thank you. A treatment, Dr. Ray Blanchard, one of the world's foremost sexologists, sexologists, excuse me, calls palliative. Another fun vocab word. Thank you. What is this vocab word? Relieving pain without dealing with the cause of the condition. In spite of its severity, however, medical transition is no longer a rarity. It is the recommended treatment for gender dysphoria a diagnosable disorder of incongruence between a felt gender and one's natal sex that is undergoing a tremendous increase in prevalence throughout the world. More and more children and adolescents are being diagnosed and are undergoing medical treatment prior even to completing puberty. The medical treatment before puberty, by the way, is puberty blockers, which pause puberty. That's the medical treatment, by the way, in case we need a recap on that. For those who express con- caution or concern, there is a familiar retort. Trust the experts. Based. This argument, however, makes mockery of the fact that there, that three... We got a whole three experts, guys. We've won the argument. I'm sorry. This argument, however, makes mockery of the fact that three of the most influential sex researchers of the last couple decades, Ray Blanchard, Michael Bailey, and the recently vindicated Ken Zucker. I have no idea what they're talking about there. All have problems with the affirmation-only transition narrative currently being promoted. You can add to this list names like other people we happen to agree with. Oh, the Lisa Littman loser. The fucking dumbass fucking researcher who fucking took surveys from parents from three anti-trans websites and all got them this and got them to say all of them started being trans when their friends were. It's a social contagion. And then had to walk it back and explain that she wasn't saying that gender affirming therapy doesn't help anyone. Remember that lady? That's one of the people they're referring to. I, I, I'm going to be honest with you. I completely missed that detail when I first read this source and put it in my list of things to go over. That's just fun. <laughs> I'm learning new things every day, dude. Reading my opposition's fucking articles is the most fun thing I've ever done in my life. Anyway, moving, moving on. Re- look at this research. Studies themselves often represented in the mainstream narrative that medical transition is well studied and that there is academic consensus around its effectiveness. Since literally every medical organization seems to agree on it. And in reality, the literature is fraught with study design problems. Like, oh, study design problems? Do you mean like Lisa Littman's, by the way? Now, 
honestly, when I first read this, I I felt like, wow, they had this <clears throat> argument kind of really well put together. But now as I'm rereading this and remembering the people that they're citing, I'm getting more and more annoyed with them and not trusting anything they're saying at face value. Anyway, including convenient sample, convenient sampling right after talking about Lisa Lippman. Anyway, lack of controls like the like the study we were talking about earlier with the fucking Target stores. Anyway, cross-sectional design. I actually don't know what that means. I will admit to being uh, uneducated on that. Low sample sizes, probably because there's, you know, trans people are a minority. Uh, short study lengths and enormously high dropout rates. Very few studies on transition evade these issues. Nobelese 2018 system systematic review of quality of life studies of transition adults. She rates only two of 29 studies as high quality. It is well recognized that there is a honeymoon period. That's actually what they were. This is what they're quoting that source for. This is uh, they were talking about the honeymoon period. So that's what the booklet was citing it for. Which does not represent a realistic picture of long term sexual and psychological status. Follow up with them later. I feel like there have been, I've been studies that we've already read that have followed up with them later, but maybe I'm wrong. When do patients? When does patient psychology stabilize? This guy considered the outcomes of 1,331 post-HRT transsexuals, outdated term, you're supposed to say transgender, with an 18.4 year average length since the beginning of treatment. The outcomes for the female to males seemed generally positive, but in the much larger male to female group, uh, total mortality was 51% higher than in the general population. We already know that they still commit suicide more often. It's just that it would be worse if they didn't transition. Does, does no one wrap their head around this and then they include in this deaths from things like cardiovascular disease and autoimmune uh, syndromes and drug abuse and unknown cause so it could literally be anything so some of it might may or may not even be related to them being transgender by the way surprisingly ne negative results and partially due to differences among authors that are interpreting the data simple as 324 post-surgery trans people with many in follow-up time over 10 years compare the sample not only to population data but to match non-trans controls do these people not think we know that trans people have higher rates of suicide is that the problem the one thing i want to point out is that when you are looking for a scientific answer to a complicated and controversial topic like this what is it right to do what's the right thing to do it's not about picking individual scientists, this guy, this guy, this guy, that you like, who say the things you want to hear. Because no matter what the issue is, you're always going to be able to do that. It's the same thing with the fucking dumbass anti-vaxxers, the COVID deniers, and the anti-maskers who can find individual doctors who agree with them. The reason why we trust the science isn't because we go shopping around for a fucking doctor or an expert who agrees with us. Because despite people being educated and experts on the subject, you're always going to find the one example of the person who believes the dumbass thing that you already want to believe that's not true. This is why we don't care about the opinions of individual scientists or individual doctors or individual psychiatrists we care about the overwhelming consensus among the entire medical community consisting of armies of doctors armies of fucking psychiatrists armies of psychologists across different organizations who are all cross-checking each other and peer-reviewing each other and trying to prove each other's findings wrong, and trying to prove hypotheses right, etc., etc., etc. Because when you have that, that means that the results that they are finding have been reproduced numerous times in numerous different environments. with different controls and different structures to their studies and their experiments. That's what you want. Which is why it's concerning when this article talks about referring to individual doctors. How about organizations of doctors? How about 
engaging with the medical community's findings as a whole. The fact that someone feels the need to focus solely on the findings of individual scientists or doctors should make you question their motivations and their intelligence and their, like, I guess, I don't want to say media literacy, uh, scientific literacy, I guess, because that's just not the way science works. It might even be the fact that these guys aren't quacks or anything, or that these guys are not like dishonest, the, the researchers who have these negative findings. It could just be the fact that they and their studies that have run have data, have findings that run contrary to the overwhelming you know, medical consensus or this, the overwhelming number of studies that have been run that suggest that gender affirming care is good, for example. It's possible that in their sample of a thousand people or 300 people, they might by chance get a finding, get data that suggests to them, oh, gender affirming care is bad. That doesn't automatically make it true. Having one study that suggests that is a start, but it doesn't tell you whether something is true or not. That's why you need multiple studies. That's why you need actual medical consensus with different people and different researchers find, running the same experiment and finding the same conclusion. Because just because you got one answer that's convenient to one group of people in one study doesn't mean, oh, we proved it true. That's not how that works. So... This is what you should think when read, and this is all, 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 regardless of the fact that this is, obviously women mean something, an organization that already has a motivation, they want to find the researchers that suggest that trans people aren't real, because that's literally what their whole fucking organization is about. Another thing to consider in regards to the whole, oh, it's just the trend bro philosophy on things, is that... The same thing happened with gay people and a lot of the same talking points against trans people you would have heard like five or ten years ago against gay people too. Awareness about trans issues becomes more prevalent. More people know about it. And then more people come out as trans. It becomes more of a prevalent thing that happens. And these people go, oh, that means people aren't just trans they aren't really trans they're just jumping on the bandwagon well is that what's happening or is there another explanation that makes more sense like there's more awareness around the issue so now more people have an explanation for the issues they were already having if you don't know what a trans person is and there's no awareness around the issue then someone with gender dysphoria is just going to suffer for the rest of their lives instead of getting treatment it's like they act surprised. There's more awareness around the issue. Now more people are coming out as trans. Well, no, duh. If, if more people, if there's more awareness around the issue, more people know what being trans is. Obviously, as a direct result, more people are going to come out as trans. That doesn't mean that they're all doing it to like follow a trend or to be sheep. It could just be the fact that more people know about it. So they're more, they're more likely to identify themselves having those problems where otherwise if literally no one knew about trans issues they wouldn't be able to it's the same thing with gay people um you know more awareness around gay issues um you know gay positivity becomes more popular more people start coming out as gay these same people were like five or ten years ago Oh, it's a trend. People think it's trendy to come out as gay. They're like fake gays or whatever. They're just jumping on the trend. And it's like, and the religious people were like, <clears throat> well, now that's become more socially acceptable to be gay. More people just want to do it. It's not that. It's just that it became more socially acceptable to come out as gay. So now you're seeing it more where otherwise they might have been hidden away or they might not have come out or might, they might not have talked about it. Or more people have realized they're gay, whereas if no one talked about gay issues ever, they might have like never explored that part of themselves or maybe never understood uh, certain feelings that they were having. So that's just a, that's just a thought on that.
Oh, they keep bringing this up. I meant to talk about this earlier. Young people uh, who are autistic are overrepresented or overrepresented uh, as coming out as trans. Like, there's like this correlation where like autistic people, um, some of them happen to come out as trans. It's like a very frequent thing that happens where trans people happen to be autistic or something. It's not untrue. It is happening, but like they're presenting this as if it's a rebuttal to like people being trans. Though they have other mental issues. It's like, yeah, so that's not an argument for or against anything. That doesn't mean that they're fake trans. That doesn't mean that being trans is fake. That doesn't mean anything. <laughs> oh, you just think you're trans because you're autistic. No, no, that's not a valid argument. Um, they said this on the earlier page and I forgot to address it. Nine large scale studies have been have found that Rates of ASD or autism tra traits range from 5 to 54% among those with gender dysphoria. Like, this is something that you could, like, be interested in. Oh, why is there a correlation between people being autistic and people being trans? But they're not, they're not like, interested in the reasons why. They just want to use that factoid to suggest, oh, being trans is invalid. Which, this doesn't even... Admitting that this is true, yeah, it is true that that correlation exists. That doesn't make anything invalid. That's not an argument against anything. They're just stupid. They don't understand that. Um, and they're putting together a persuasive pamphlet. They're not interested in the truth. So that's that's just interesting. Oh, and this is from the segment I referred to with that dumbass Leslie lady. Leslie, what was her last name? Go back in the video. Anyway, who literally her study was that she pulled parents from three anti-trans websites and, you know, surveyed them. And they all said, whoa, my kids started uh, getting into the trans stuff at the same time as their friends did. That means it's just a social contagion. This is the page on her shit. Um, <laughs> she had the fucking issue a correction to her study and make it clear, by the way. This is not like a, you know, big scientific whatever. This is literally just surveying parents who were already on anti-trans websites. <laughs> Good job, bro. Really cool study. Real cool made-up term you just came up with. Anyway, moving on. The gender affirmative treatment model. Where am I going with? Oh, yeah, this is actually where I'm stopping next. Despite the fact that there are no long-term studies to support medical interventions for children who are confused about their sex that part i mean i would have to go back through the sources i've already read and see which ones are long-term studies anyway parents are increasingly being told by medical professionals to assume that the best way to treat their child's transgender feelings facts are feelings bro sorry is with social i'm trying to go back to being more serious is with social and medical transition this treatment protocol recommends a social transition in early childhood puberty blockers in early adolescence cross-sex hormones for teenagers, steps that are progressively more difficult to reverse inhibit a child's ability to... Yeah, that's the point. That's literally the point. You don't start with the most the irreversible treatment possible. Um, <laughs> what Would you rather it be the opposite? Like, the whole point of puberty blockers, which they're against because they're idiots, is because when they're 9 years old, 11 years old, you're not sure whether their gender dysphoria is going to persist later on into their life. So you're not just going to start giving them cross-sex hormones, or that's the term they use. The correct term is like hormone replacement therapy. You're not going to start doing that right out the gate because you want to make sure that the issue is going to persist before you start doing the more high-risk, the more irreversible treatments, which is something that they pretend to have concern about. But then they're still stupid enough to be against puberty blockers. It's like, do you actually care about this? Or are you just trying to like hit the issue on your front on all fronts to get parents as fucking scared of the whole trans social contagion as possible? They don't actually care about helping kids. They're just trying to make a persuasive fucking booklet. And then they give this table, which accurately enough describes, yes when it, they're really young it's a social thing it's about changing your name and your pronouns and the way you dress and the way that people address you and then as puberty starts to hit it's puberty blockers to pause puberty and we're gonna get to some of the loaded language they use in here in a second the pause puberty uh you know to see if the issue persists 
uh, to see if uh, doing that helps them to stop them from going through the harm and the you know struggle of going through the puberty of their assigned sex at birth that they're not comfortable with, etc. And then as they start to get older, okay, now we know that this is a serious issue. We know you need gender affirming care. We're giving you the the you know the hormone replacement therapy. I'm trying not to use their language anymore because I don't trust it. I'm trying to use the actual language I see from like the medical organizations, etc. And then top surgery for girls. <clears throat> Top surgery for girls, which is the chest. Excuse me, for girls. Sorry. Reading their language has gotten into my head. So if I, like, misspeak or misgender people in general, I'm not doing it on purpose. For trans men who were assigned female at birth, top surgery for the chest to make it more masculine. And at the end of that road, um, when they're adult, bottom surgery to do surgery for the genitalia. So that's correct. And at any age, <laughs> uh, you know, changing shit on birth certificates and school records to reflect their gender at birth. Now, when they give this table, they go, oh, here's an example of um, the treatment that's given and the age range is given. Let's see what the risks they say are. What are the risks to social transitioning where you're just changing your name and pronouns well the risk is that they're more likely to persist with all the trans stuff that's that's not a risk also the data suggests they're going to do that anyway so this this is bullshit moving on where are the risks of puberty blockers brittle bones you don't know that the medical associations you quote and say this don't know that they say that they do not know if there is a long-term effect on the bone density of people who take puberty blockers and that they need to wait for the people who 30 years ago were taking puberty blockers to get older so that they can know this you're asserting it here as if it's true you don't know that you're full of shit joint problems they don't know that either impaired memory I'm curious. I that I also saw in one of the medical organizations that I actually trust them reference to we don't know what the effects are going to be on teen brain development. I don't remember them specifically calling out memory. What is the, what is these guys source for that? This is in KHN New. I don't even see anything about memory in here. I actually didn't pull this up before, so it'll be interesting to see where they got this from on the fly. Oh, by the way, puberty blockers have been used in other situations for non-trans people as well to treat other ailments, but that's besides the point. Adverse event reports don't mean that the treatment's caught. <laughs> I'm getting so mad I can't breathe. The vitamin water went down the wrong pipe. I'm sorry. Adverse event reports can be written by anyone and are not verified by clinicians. Someone filing a fucking adverse event report doesn't mean that the treatment fucking caused it. It's not proof of anything. It's not like followed up with a clinician later. You can't use it as fucking evidence of anything. Not for dipshits to write articles asserting that there are problems with the treatment. This is not a proper way to cite adverse event reports. You saw the... I can't use the arse there. You saw the dipshit fucking anti-vax and COVID denier people do the same fucking bullshit tactic with, you know, the anti-vax shit where they're talking about adverse event reports. This is just isn't how adverse event reports work. All right. Anyway, with that out of the way... Where is the fucking reference to memory? Flag something as a potential cause of something, sure. But it's not like a fucking proof that there's actually an issue. It's something to follow up on. The adverse event reports themselves are not evidence. And this fucking idiot writing the article is citing them as such. Because they don't fucking know anything. 
Oh, precocious puberty. When puberty happens too soon in a child, sometimes they use puberty blockers because having puberty too soon, I guess it's called precocious puberty, can cause medical problems. Well, if it was a fucking dosing error, then obviously that's not a problem. It, I mean, that obviously it's a problem. It's not a problem with the fucking drug itself if you're not dosing it correctly, you fucking idiot. Whatever. I'm over it. I, I, t I took the wrong dosage of a drug and then it caused a problem. Wow. Must be a problem with the drug. What the fuck? What are you talking about? I hate... I hate the person who wrote this article. That's who I hate. I want, I want, I'm reading this. Like, There's this German study that said there was no harm to the bones from the drug. Even though 7 of 41 women studied, or 17%, had osteopenia. So for years after treatment, what well, was this the result of the drug or was it the result of something else? Like, who am I going to trust to like, control for that variable and figure that out? People doing the study or the dumbass writing the article? Who am I, Who do I trust more? Anyway, I don't even see a single fucking mention of memory in that fucking article. So it sounds like they just pulled that one fucking thing from their ass. So that's cool, I guess. The risk is that they'll go on to use... I love how at each of these entries... Whoa, the risk of this treatment is that they might go on to use this treatment. And the risk of this treatment is that they might go on to use this treatment. That's not, that's not a risk of the treatment itself. It's like a snake eating its own tail. Can't you just have an honest table saying, hey, this top one here, there is no risk to it. This one, the risk is this, this, this. The risk of this one is, does it have to be that one refers to the other? You're literally just trying to fill out your fucking chart. The risks for hormone therapy, sterility if used after puberty blockers is true that that is a risk. For women, lowered voice... If a trans man who is women at who is female at birth, th the hormones lower their voice. That's not a risk. That's literally that's quite literally what they want to happen. <laughs> oh, interesting inclusion, but okay. Weight gain, balding, possible cardiovascular disease. The cardiovascular disease I know I've read is true. Type two diabetes, bone density loss. They were lying about that with fucking puberty blockers because that's not known to be true. So I don't know whether or not it's true for these, for the hormone therapy in general. So I would have to look into that. Increased risk of cancers, so on and so forth. What's the risk of top surgery? Loss of sensation, infections, irreversibility. They know it's irreversible when they go to do it, by the way. That's not a risk. Irreversibility isn't a risk, first off. It is irreversible, and they know that going into it, and they don't want to reverse it. Post-surgical complications, the general SRS are common in both men and women. Okay. <laughs> and the funniest part of all, what is the risk of changing sex recording on birth certificates, school records, or other identification? The risk is that there will be inaccurate recording of vital statistics on birth certificates and medical records. So that's, even with shit, I know with, I know because I followed the drama of, I'm not even going to mention it indirectly because I'll get attention that will be fun for a while, but I'll soon tire of. Uh, when trans people have criminal records, the police department will keep track of their assigned sex at birth as well as their new gender identity. Believe it or not, it's not impossible to track both, so you don't need to have an accurate recording of vital statistics. First of all, and then secondly, the whole point is that, well, you're kind of loading the question when you're saying it's inaccurate. To them, it's not inaccurate, but that's besides the point. And then they also had mistaken sex and medical care. Do you, the, the, their medical professionals are going to know they're trans. In fact, I wouldn't surprise me if their medical records detail that they were, had a different sex at birth and now they have a new gender identity and they've had all these treatments in the past. You're acting as if someone's going to go into a medical center and the person like treating them is going to have no idea that they're trans. This is obviously fucking stupid. Obviously, they're going to know that. And obviously, they're going to have had conversations with their doctors about the treatment they're fucking receiving. So, this is an idiotic chart. 
before I got into this table, I completely forgot to mention. It's really funny. When, above here, they have these sources. Parents are increasingly being told by medical professionals to assume that the best way to treat their ch child's transgender feelings is with social and med medical transition. And then they link source after source detailing the reasons why gender affirming care is more helpful than trying to fucking deny them their identity and that this is actually what works and it's like did you think this helped your argument there's an urgent need to provide more research data documenting the efficacy of these different programs but the recent findings of the amsterdam group provide hope that the care particularly within the watchful waiting and gender affirmative models is promoting gender health in their words, the treatment, including puberty, suppression, cross-sex hormones, and then in adulthood, gender affirmation surgery leads to improved psychological functioning of transgender adolescents while enabling them to make important age-appropriate de developmental trans transitions. I can't talk anymore because I've been going for three and a half hours. It contributes to a satisfactory objective and subjective well-being in young adulthood. So they're, li they're, they're literally like fucking citing the studies proving them wrong I, I i haven't gone through this entire fucking pamphlet on the standards of care for trans people but are we sterilizing children because the gender affirmer because the gender affirmative model of medical treatment prevents the natural sexual maturation of a child's reproductive organs after results in permanent sterility for the children for whom it is prescribed. It is true that this is a risk, by the way. But the problem is that people who are trans would say the trade-off was worth it because without it, I didn't want to kill myself. And you know what? I didn't really want fucking children in the first place. So being sterile isn't a problem for me. Studies show that in many cases, children diagnosed as gender dysphoric will later self-identify as same-sex attracted. Feelings of same-sex attraction should in no way indicate the need for hormone treatments of surgical procedures on children or teens. So first of all, in many cases, not all cases, some of the trans people come out as same-sex attracted. So they're referring to the fucking fact that trans women will go, oh, I like men. Or trans men will go, oh, I prefer women. And they're trying to use that as a way to prove that that's the real issue. <laughs> they're just gay, bro, LOL. They don't need to be trans. That's not it. That's not valid. The issue of someone's orientation and their gender identity are two completely separate issues. They're try they, they rightly say, um, they don't rightly say, they say it in the wrong way. Uh, you know, having, you know, same-sex orientation in no way indicates that someone is trans, but no one is arguing that it does. You're the one who are trying to fucking twist together and mix the issues of someone's orientation and their identity. In fact, the two have nothing to do with each other. It's a really stupid argument. It's really lazy. Anyway, I just wanted to touch on that. Crazy fucking new piece of information we discovered trans women a lot of the times happen to like men must prove they're not fucking trans they're just gay <laughs> it's like what what argument do you think you're making right now was that supposed to be a surprising piece of information that convinced me that being trans was not real it's just stupid anyway are gender affirmative treatments improving lives in 2016 there was more than 3,000 sex reassignment surgeries performed indicating a 20 percent increase in those procedures between 2015 and 2016 some claim that medical transition is improving lives but long-term studies call into question whether transition has a long-term positive impact while there are short-term studies showing some improvement to mental health after transition the two best and longest term studies show <laughs> two whole studies sorry show little or no benefit at all short-term studies may only capture a temporary honeymoon period of relief going to a long-term study conducted in the LGBT affirming country of Sweden, transitioning does not prevent suicide. This 2011 study followed 324 transgender identified people who had undergone sex reassignment surgery, found that after surgery, these adults were nearly five times more likely to attempt suicide and nearly 20 times more likely to commit suicide than the general population. This is the same study, by the way, that we had before. 
that was referred to before. Let me open it in case I don't already have it. This is the same one that we looked at that was the 324 people from Sweden. Uh, and this sample of 324, they said that they were more likely to commit suicide than, you know, people who weren't trans, which was, oh, surprise, surprise. We already knew that. And then I led with the, and then I followed up with all the studies proving, not proving, excuse me, providing a lot more evidence and, you know, a lot more than just this one study saying that actually gender affirming care and transitioning does help them, does provide better outcomes, and leads to reduced rates of suicide. They're referring to the fact that they're more likely to commit suicide after transitioning than like cis people. We already knew that. The problem is they would be more likely to commit suicide than if they didn't transition at all. Did they misquote this study? Hold on. They were more... It's trying to say in this sentence that they were more likely to attempt suicide after transitioning than they were before. Are they just misquoting the study and lying or is there part of this results that I didn't read correctly? Let us let me double check myself. Wait, no. Then for controls of the same birth sex. This is cis, cis people. Higher during follow-up than cis people. These, These people, people are saying that they think that sex reassignment although alleviating dysphoria may not suffice as treatment, and that it should inspire improved psychiatric and somatic care after sex reassignment. Oh my fucking god, okay. I'm not, re I'm not an idiot. I'm not misreading this study. They fucking are. The people who made this study are not saying that you shouldn't have people go through sexual reassignment surgery. They're saying that there needs to be improved care after that happens. They say it to transitioning does alleviate dysphoria, but there needs to be better treatment after that fact. <laughs> to fucking realize how fucking hard they were lying about that. So, you know, them, this f fucking whole bullet point is fucking bullshit. Good to know. So now we go to the next part of their booklet. And my God, I see the end in sight. I'm starting to be able to read the titles of these tabs. <clears throat> anyway, many transgender identified people eventually discover transitioning does not solve the distress they feel about their bodies. And, and they make the decision to return to identifying as their biological sex. Describing themselves as detransitioners, they often explain that they were never offered comprehensive psychological care before they were referred for hormonal and medical procedures that could not be rectified when they change their minds. So it, for those of them that this is true for, it's not the standard of the care to just give them hormonal treatments before psychological care. At every step of the way, you know, your psychiatrist, your psychologist are supposed to be talking with you and monitoring your gender dysphoria, obviously. There are, it is possible that there are people where, you know, who for valid reasons, decide to detransition that it wasn't personally right for them they're the minority and that does not mean that you know giving gender affirming care to trans people who for the most part do need it is somehow invalid it says many note that it doesn't even say most and it has quotes from uh detransitioners but let's read from this Detransition is more common in the earlier stages of transition, particularly before surgeries, like before bottom surgeries and top surgeries. So in the phase where they're doing uh, hormonal replacement therapy, uh, which is generally while they're still young, before they become adults, unless they don't start treatment until they're adults. Anyway, so before surgeries. The number of detransitioners is unknown, with estimates ranging from less than 1% to as many as 8%. So, you know, the generous estimation is that there might be 8% of trans people who detransition, and the low ball figure is that there might be 1% of them that detransition. Uh, rates are reported to be higher uh, among prepubertal children. We could even look at the, um, the actual sources. Exceedingly rare. Researchers often put the percentage of regret between 1% and 2%. Detransitioning is actually far more common in the stages before surgery when people are still exploring their options. So that makes sense. This is like we said, where if at some point the kid's like, hey, this isn't the right stage for me, they could back off. Usually that happens before they start hormonal treatments, right? Uh, while, they're, while they're still doing either the, just the social transitioning or the puberty blockers, but... It's possible that they might get to the hormonal stage and they might like, oh, wait, this wasn't the right answer for me. That doesn't mean that all trans issues are fake now. That's not proof of that. And because people get fucking angsty about 
fucking Wikipedia. You can go read the article. Who cites the studies that she's read. All right. So just so we know where the information from Wikipedia is coming from. Study finds long-term mental health benefits of gender-affirming surgery for transgender individuals. For individuals, gender-affirming surgery can lead to long-term mental health benefits, according to new research published online today in the American Journal of Psychiatry. The study found that among transgender individuals with gender incongruence, undergoing gender-affirming surgery was significantly associated with a decrease in mental health treatment over time. The study found the odds of receiving mental health treatment were reduced by 8% every year since gender-affirming surgery. What is this? Gender HQ. All right, another pro-trans site, to be clear. The Cornell review does confirm that very low regret rates, 3.4% at the higher end, and populations of adults who were treated at a time with much more pressure not to transition due to stigma and other a gatekeeping model. So they're basically saying that there are people, 33 to 3.8% of people who do regret transitioning, but that they may or may not choose to detransition. However, as they go on to say, there are different reasons why people might want to detransition. Most common reasons for detransitioning wasn't that it was the wrong move for them or that they're not really trans. The most common reasons are that they weren't being supported at home or that it was causing them problems in the workplace or they're being harassed afterwards for being trans. Let's look at the, their source for this. The survey explored respondents' experiences discussing their gender identity with professionals, such as psychologists, counselors, a clear pressure from those professionals to detransition or stop being transgender. Few respondents detransitioned, and many of those who did detransition did so only temporarily and were living according to their gender identity at the time of the survey. So that some of them detransitioned only temporarily. Some of them had pressure from professionals or psychologists, or counselors, or religious advisors, of course, the religious advisors, to stop being transgender. 8% had done it at some point, but the, of those who detransitioned, 62% were still living in a gender different from the one they were assigned at birth. Okay, I, 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 so there are reasons why people have regret or detransition. It's not always because, oh, detransitioning was wrong for me. Oh, well, you can certainly find those people and farm quotes for them to say that the trans stuff is out of hand. You can certainly do that if that's your goal. But here is something from NBC News. Media's detransition narrative is fueling misconceptions, trans advocates say. And this will probably cover all the stuff we already read from that one study. No one disputes that transition regret does exist and that there are trans people who return to the sex they were assigned at birth. However, advocates say some of the recent coverage around the topic portrays detransitioning as much more common than it actually is and also probably doesn't cover the reasons why they detransition. There are an estimated 1.4 million transgender adults in the U.S., according to the Williams Institute at the UCLA School of Law, which we've been re talking about a lot on here. And the UK Government Equality's Office tentatively estimates their blah, blah, blah. Who cares about Europe? Uh, <laughs> while information regarding how many trans people the tr detransitions is sparse. Those who work with the trans community say it is uncommon. Information that does exist appears to corroborate the claim. 2015 survey and survey of nearly 28,000 people. Uh, the study we were actually reading, only 8% of respondents reported detransitioning, and 62% of those people said they only detransitioned temporarily. The most common reason for detransitioning, according to the survey, was pressure from a parent. So. While it's really convenient for anti-trans propaganda writers to refer to detransitioners, uh, people detransition for reasons that these kinds of propaganda articles won't explain to you. But they will farm quotes from the people who are doing it, uh, who happen to have detransitioned because they felt it was the wrong move for them and that their clinicians moved too fast. School and the transgender trend under pressure from well-funded LGBT activist organizations. And then they put a source. A rescinded 2016 guidance letter to schools from the Obama administration. Aggressive state agency involvement. <laughs> Threats of litigation. The influence of the media. Public schools are under increasing pressure to drop gender inclusion policies. Replacing all references to sex with the subjective concept of gender identity. First of all, it's not replacing the concept of sex. You could still talk about biological sex. It's like a thing that we talk about in addition to it. Like this is 
additional information about why some people feel gender dysphoria and why some people might have biological sex but present themselves in, you know, the identity of a different gender. But that's not why I wanted to talk about this segment here. It's just the fucking irony of complaining about well-funded LGBT activist organizations pushing an agenda when you're literally reading a fucking booklet, a pamphlet from the Heritage Foundation. It's a very well-known fucking conservative... This is their own website, by the way. Conservative fucking organization. And they are... They meet with congressional staff. They are lobbyists. Meetings with members of Congress. Candidate briefings. Working group events on Capitol Hill. Heritage and the Like, they are a huge organization with a lot of reach. A lot of activity in the fucking Capitol of building itself. And with Congress itself. It's just ironic to see. And I'm not going to look into, like, how much money goes through that organization. Blah, blah, blah. It's just really fucking rich to see that fucking group complain about well-funded LGBT activist organizations. But that was more of a petty thing than anything else. Doesn't Title IX... I told you I was getting to this. Doesn't Title IX require that schools allow students and staff to use opposite sex restrooms and locker rooms? No. Title IX specifically states that schools can maintain separate living facilities for the different sexes. And the implementing regulations of Title IX state that schools may... Pre- Provide separate toilet, locker, room, and shower facilities on the basis of sex without committing sex discrimination. Title IX is an anti-sex discrimination law specifically for education institutions that take federal funding. Title IX basically said that you can prohibit against... uh, You couldn't prohibit. I can't talk. It is fucking 11. I've been going for four hours. Please throw me a bone. It's a law that says you can't discriminate on people on the basis of sex. And it has exceptions, like you can have boys' schools. That's not, you know, disallowed. That's not wrong. And it lists as an exception, you can have separate restrooms for, like, boys and girls or men and women. And that's not, like, discriminating against women or discriminating against men. It's not discrimination. Uh, What's actually happening is they're adding to the list of things you're not allowed to discriminate against, like sex. Things like gender identity or sex orientation. So now um, you're not allowed to discriminate against people on the basis of their sex or their orientation or their gender identity, i.e. if they're trans or not. It's just they're adding that to the list of things you can't discriminate against. So they're trying to do this dumbass straw man argument where it's like, no, having separate restrooms isn't discrimination on the basis of sex. No one is saying that it is. You're missing the fucking point on purpose because they even like, they even talk about in here that the, oh, the Obama administration in the past and the Biden administration now tried to add uh, gender identity as something you can't discriminate against either. And we don't like that. That's actually what's happening. So here's from the U.S. Department of Education itself. This is just the text of the bill as it was, I believe, as it was originally written. Oh, and then I guess the amendments are down here. By the way, let's go back to U.S. Department of Education. U.S. Department of Education confirms Title IX protects students from discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity. So now, it's not only prohibiting institutions from discriminating against you on the basis of your biological sex it's also adding in you can't discriminate against gay people and you can't discriminate against trans people the u.s department of education's office for civil rights today issued a notice of interpretation explaining that it will enforce title IX's prohibition on discrimination on the basis of sex to include discrimination based on sexual orientation and discrimination based on gender identity i i i I kind of misspoke earlier. They are saying that you're discriminating against trans people, for example, on the basis of sex, but it's because their gender identity, their sex is relevant to the fact that they have a gender identity that's, you know, that's relevant to the fact that they're not identifying as their sex at birth. So I guess their sex is related in an indirect way. Hell 9 of the Education Amendments of 1972 prohibits discrimination on the basis of sex in any education program or activity offered by a recipient of federal financial assistance. 
The department's interpretation stems from the landmark U.S. Supreme Court decision in Bostock v. Clayton County, which I kind of issued one year ago this week, so 2020, I was going to look up the year, in which the Supreme Court recognized that it is impossible to discriminate against a person based on their sexual orientation or gender identity without discriminating against their person based on sex because their sexual orientation, their sex is relevant. Someone having a gender identity that's, you know, different from their sex at birth, their sex is relevant. So in an indirect way, by discriminating against someone who is trans, you are discriminating against them on the basis of sex. That's the point. That's that's the that's the non-convoluted way to word that. <laughs> we we got it eventually. The Supreme Court has upheld the right for LGBTQ plus people to live and work without fear of harassment, exclusion, and discrimination. And our LGBTQ plus students have the same rights and deserve the same protections. I'm proud to have directed the Office for Civil Rights to enforce Title IX, protect all students. Da, 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 da. LGBTQ plus students often face additional challenges in schools, including disproportionately experiencing persistent bullying, harassment, and victimization. The vulnerability of LGBTQ plus students has only increased during the COVID-19 pandemic, leaving them without access to school-based mental health services and other supports. So when these guys say, oh no, Title IX has nothing to do with you know, someone being trans, it doesn't mean that, you know, trans students uh, can't be discriminated against in things like, I guess, bathrooms or locker rooms, which are the two issues they love to focus on. Uh, the Department of Education, the United States Department of Education, and uh, the U.S. Supreme Court happened to disagree with them. So, <laughs> in fact, that's the 2020 U.S. Supreme Court, by the way. Not exactly the most liberal progressive court uh, that's ever been in existence, so... Uh, the idiots who wrote this booklet don't have much of a leg to stand on, I would say. Let's go over this page that they had. Hold on. Let's scroll down to it instead of just looking at my snapshot of the page. That's meant to remind myself to stop and talk about these sources when I get there. Title IX of the Education Amendments Act of 1972 is a federal law which states that no person in the United States shall, on the basis of sex, be exclu excluded from participation in, be denied benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination under any education program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. Title IX applies to all education institutions, both public and private, that receive federal funds. Congress enacted Title IX as a response to concerns that female students not have the same opportunities as male students in school classrooms and in athletics. That is true. That is why it originally was written. Title IX does not require schools to eliminate distinct facilities for boys and girls. That is true, but no one's also arguing that they have to. What we are saying is that putting in non-binary restrooms, for example, could help uh, trans students, but also that trans students who are Literally, you know, for example, tr uh, taking hormonal therapies to transition to the opposite sex shouldn't be forced into the bathroom of their sex at birth. That doesn't make any sense. And that's not fair for them. Um, not committing sex discrimination. Though Title IX clearly recognizes only binary sex, not gender identity. That's not true. The Supreme Court disagreed. Well, it doesn't explicitly talk about it, but the Supreme Court disagrees with you. It thinks that this is a relevant issue, the Title IX or gender expression. There are efforts to redefine Title IX by claiming that sex also means gender identity. Under the Obama administration, the Department of Education's Office for Civil Rights and the U.S. Department of Justice in 2016 issued a guidance letter commonly referred to as the Dear Colleague Letter. The school is reinterpreting sex in Title IX. Well, to be clear, they didn't reinterpret sex. They said, by definition, if you are discriminating against someone who is trans. You are discriminating against them on the basis of their sex and their sex at birth, not matching their gender identity. Ergo, you are committing sex discrimination. They're not redefining sex. They're s explaining how discriminating against someone who is trans is relevant to sex discrimination, but you can misunderstand that on purpose if you want. The Dear Colleague letter stated that both federal agencies must treat a student's gender identity as the student's sex. Everyone knows that biological sex is different from the gender identity. Okay, treat it as the sex is a misphrasing on your part. Anyway, for purposes of enforcing Title IX, 
The Obama letter was rescinded in 2017 by the Trump administration. Well, guess what? Now Biden's back in office and he, and we'll get to it later, uh, is making changes to Title IX himself or proposing them at this stage. So prepare for that, buddy. In federal courts, the Trump administration, DOJ, had weighed in on cases and stated that its understanding of sex is biological sex and not gender identity. Well, first of all, <laughs> no one was saying that sex was the same as gender identity. I feel like this is a misquote too, but I would have to look at those. But the fucking Supreme Court case that's being referred to right here happened in 2020. Wait, was it while Trump was still in office or no? Wait, no. Yeah, wait. I'm, I'm a fucking idiot for saying that. Fucking Biden was inaugur inaugurated in 2021 after the election in 2020. Guess what? Why, why are they leaving out the fact when they say... The, where was it? Where was it? Where was it? In federal courts, the Trump administration, DOJ, had weighed on cases stated that it's understanding of sex biological. Why are they acting like the Supreme Court hadn't already made a decision under trump's watch by the way that fucking discriminating against fucking trans people and gender identity is discrimination on the basis of sex why they leave that out i wonder so this is fucking bullshit they're fucking lying by omission on that one and i don't even know if the doj was necessarily saying what they're claiming they were saying here either but the U.S. House of Representatives also attempted to redefine sex. Addition of gender identity as a federally protected class could lead to changes to curricula in public schools requiring texts that promote gender identity to children as young as pre-K. As if that was a bad thing. Because yeah, they also want to add gender identity as a protected class to Title IV of the Civil Rights Act, and obviously these people are big mad about that. Additionally, the Equality Act's redefinition of sex rendered Title IX irrelevant as all schools would receive public funding would be subjected to gender identity discrimination lawsuits if they maintain single-sex private facilities. Wait. I, my understanding is that it would be okay to have, like, men and women's restrooms. You would just fucking allow the trans kids to use the restroom that matched their gender identity, not their biological sex. Am I to understand that in order to not discriminate against trans people, they think they have to get rid of all men and women restrooms. I don't think that's the argument. Maybe I'm missing something, but I think that they're being intentionally dense here. That's not what's being fucking... That's not what's being demanded at all. Whatever. What, further, biological males who identify as females could claim discrimination if they're not allowed to compete in sports. We'll get to the sports in a second. The, Equal the Equality Act did not become law, and as of 2019, there is no federal law that requires public schools to allow boys in the girls' restrooms or girls in the boys' restrooms. Well, actually, the Supreme Court would disagree with you because they think Title IX does mean you can't discriminate on the basis of gender discrimination. So, all right, let's go through. So we went through this. Here's the Wikipedia gender identity under Title IX, and my God, we are so close. Title IX of the United States Education Amendments of 1972 prohibits discrimination on the basis of sex in educational programs and activities that receive financial assistance from the federal government. The Obama administration interpreted Title IX to cover discrimination on the basis of assigned sex, gender identity, and them being transgender, which gender identity covers, so this is a little redundant, but also orientation, which isn't listed here for some reason. The Trump administration determined that the question of access to sex-segregated facilities should be left to the states and local school districts to decide the validity. Speaking is hard. The validity of the executive's position is being tested in the federal courts, and of course, as we saw in 2020, that Supreme Court case that I'll bring up one more time, they decided gender identity was relevant and that you could not discriminate against trans people. And that in order to discriminate against someone who is trans, you are necessarily committing sex discrimination. August 2020, this court affirmed a 2018 lower court ruling that discrimination on the basis of gender identity is discrimination on the basis of sex and is prohibited under Title IX. And there are all these other court cases that we, you could go through if you wanted. And one last article on this. Hello, Mary. How you doing? 
sweeping Title IX changes would shield trans students, abuse survivors. Right now, Biden is, as and these people are super ass mad about it, making state making uh proposing changes to more concretely and explicitly add gender identity as something you cannot discriminate against under Title IX, despite the fact that the Supreme Court already decided that by nef- definition, discrimination on the basis of someone's gender identity is sex discrimination. I guess he's just making it more clear. And he undoes uh, the rules devised during the Trump administration where Trump tried to take steps to walk that back. So it goes through, this is a this was a proposal. I tried to look into it. I haven't seen that this like has been passed or anything yet. But this is something that is being discussed. Ah, it was signed by Nixon. I knew I read that somewhere. I read it in this article before uh, last night when I was preparing all of this. Obviously, the conservatives reject this interpretation because they big mad. <laughs> Kevin Roberts, president of the Right Wing Heritage Foundation. The people partially responsible for this document. Why am I not surprised? I say all this new proposals, the new proposals rules for transgender students and urge students and parents to flood the Department of Education with comments opposing the rule. So if you are familiar or blissfully unaware of the conservative talking heads like Jordan Peterson, that loser teacher from Canada, professor from Canada, this is the Bill C-16. It was amending the Canadian Human Rights Act to add gender identity or expression into the list of things that you cannot discriminate against and people lost their fucking minds and they did all of those fun little videos claiming that they're making it they're they're censoring us they're gonna throw you in jail for misgendering people that's not what it was it was basically especially if like your boss is harassing you because you're trans or because you know you were born a man, but now you identify as a woman. If they were fucking giving you shit for that over and over, making your life hell, you could sue them for discrimination. That's what it meant. I'm just bringing it up as like a parallel example. When p- the same thing that happened in Canada is happening with uh, America and Title IX, which we'll get to later, where they're adding transgender people and gender identity to the list of things that you cannot discriminate against. Now they talk about fair play in sports. In order for women to compete safely and excel in athletics, they need women's sports. Sex-specific teams and uh, women's category where only women can play. So this is the next thing that they're going to talk about. Uh, They'll say... Men, uh, the si- average size, strength, and speed uh, give them an advantage in most sports. Uh, before puberty, boys and girls are generally on the similar levels, but after puberty, uh, t- the testosterone that's striking effect gives the men more of an advantage, so on and so forth. And then they give a whole bunch of stats to support that. This is the... This is the part that I don't have any pushback on the uh, descriptive claims they're making. It is true. If you've ever gone to, obviously, a track meet, uh, <laughs> the difference between... And it's, it's, some of the women even work harder, but the difference between you know their times uh, re- regard to the men, especially if you have them run the same race at the same time, is noticeable. Uh, the issue is that they're pointing out Hey, if someone, for example, went through puberty with, you know, more testosterone, but now they identify as a woman and they go into sports, we think that's unfair. They always focus on the trans women and they never talk about the trans men. We'll talk about why that is in a second. But for specifically school sports, the point isn't necessarily and you will have educators come out and say this and you'll have like coaches come out and say this. The point isn't necessarily uh, for it to be, you know, focused around the competitiveness and, you know, making everything super fair. It's more about getting kids to collaborate on a team and getting them out doing things and doing physical activities. Um, And it's healthy in those ways. These concerns do become more relevant. However, when you get to like 
post high school, like college or like the Olympics as a crazy extreme example or like more competitive leagues because trans women who are women, not saying they're not, the hormones that they take to transition to being a woman does make them closer um, in terms of all of this to being on par with women than with men. Uh, it doesn't make up the actual the hormone therapy doesn't make up all the difference. So they will still have a slight advantage over, say, cis women for the trans women who are competing in sports. That's true. And the pro trans people on my side who say that's not true are wrong, unfortunately, uh, as convenient as it would be for us if it wasn't. Uh, the problem is you also can't throw trans women in with cis men because now the trans woman wouldn't be able to compete. Uh, they would be at a disadvantage and that wouldn't be fair either. If you wanted to come up with a better solution than this, uh, the proper solution to this problem probably wouldn't be throwing people into the sports categories relevant to their sex at birth. And there's other reasons for this. For example, why do conservatives never talk about trans men when talking about sports? Well, the reason is it doesn't make any sense to throw a trans man in w to cis women's sports because now you've made all this fuss about how you don't want the cis women to be at a disadvantage, but now you threw in a trans man who, while assigned female at birth, is now taking testosterone as hormonal replacement therapy treatment and is now going to outcompete them so the conservatives like to think that they're solving the problem by suggesting that oh people should just do the sport of their assigned sex at birth they're causing the same problem they're complaining about even in women's sports uh they, they keep saying that it would destroy women's sports uh to allow trans women to compete with them who were assigned male at birth. And while it's true that trans women would have an advantage over them, even after rep hormonal replacement therapy, uh, doing the inverse doesn't help either. You would still be, quote unquote, destroying women's sports by having trans men who were born women, but who have taken testosterone as a hormonal treatment, compete against them. Now the cis women can't compete against the trans men. So how have you solved the problem? I think that the way that the conservatives would probably respond to this would be to like just not let the trans men compete at all by saying, oh, like, they would probably call it like they would probably refer to them taking hormonal treatments as them doing steroids and just ban them because they're taking testosterone. And now the trans people don't get to compete at all. How nice is that? But I'm not saying that it's an easy problem to solve and, you know. I'm not saying that it's a good idea or a good solution to just throw trans women, say, in the Olympics into cis women's categories and telling cis women who are unhappy about it to just deal with it, lol. Um, I can see why that solution or that suggestion would anger people. It's possible that there could be like another way. For example, it probably wouldn't work to make a separate category for trans people, not just because it would be otherizing to them, but because there aren't enough trans people to make that category like filled with competition uh, because they would be in the minority and there would be, you know, not enough people competing. We, maybe what you could do is you could keep the uh, category that cis women compete in and they have separate so that they can compete amongst themselves and feel like, you know, everything's fair and balanced. And then you have an open category where everyone can compete in if they want to. Like, men, cis men, cis women, trans people, they all can compete in that category. Um, and maybe people would feel like, you know, women's sports aren't being destroyed. But that n no one's feeling left out and trans people aren't feeling like they're being otherized or anything. That's probably not a very satisfying answer either. Um, there are probably trans people, the trans women specifically would probably still want to compete in cis women's sports and they probably wouldn't be happy with that solution. And there are probably like trans activists who would listen to me saying this and probably, you know, be very upset with me. But honestly, this is just a, the sports thing is a question to which there literally just is no satisfying answer to. Um, 
it would be really nice if we could sit back and say, actually, you know, trans women are 100%, you know, there's no advantages over cis women and it's totally okay for them to go into cis women's sports and there's no problem with it and people should just get over it. And, you know, the hormone treatment is so advanced that it actually brings them in line with cis women. It would be really convenient and simple and satisfying to say that, but none of that is unfortunately true, at least not at this time. So um, that's just like the problem here. So with the sports stuff specifically... If we're talking about stuff outside of schools, this would be the thing that's hardest to argue with conservatives about because whether we like to admit it or not, there are some concerns that they could raise that as pro-trans as we could be are valid you know, in certain respects. But as far as schools go and like middle school children or high school children go, uh, this is less of an issue. Um, high school sports is mostly about teaching kids to collaborate on teams and having them doing extracurricular activities and getting them engaged and having them be active. Uh, it's not about as much as the kids probably don't feel this way, as much as I probably didn't feel this way when I was a kid. It's not just about like being competitive and making everything like fucking as even and balanced as possible. That becomes more relevant in like fucking college and like competitive leagues and like the Olympics and shit. All right. So I've said the part that's going to get me in trouble with my own side. So there we go. <sighs> Chapter 5. We have two things left. Thank God. Oh my God. We're almost there. A respectful school is a place for open debate and free speech. A place where students of all faiths or no faith at all feel welcome. <laughs> kind of referring to the fact that their whole opposition to this issue is based on their Christian faith. You know, 2,000 years ago, they didn't know where the sun went at night let alone whether or not trans people existed. They had no concept of the issue, but I think the quote that they would use is the fucking one about God making you in their, their image or something like that. But moving on. No student should be compelled to use incorrect pronouns. Well, they shouldn't. That's why they should use the correct pronouns, i.e. the correct pronouns of the trans people, who uh, what they identify as. But obviously, they're using it the inverse way. Which convey the message that it is impossible that it is possible to change sex. No one's saying you can change biological sex. They're talking about gender identity, which even you admit earlier in this document, they see as being separate from biological sex. Anyway, to require students to communicate an idea with which they may have serious disagreement is to deny students their right to free speech. Oh, and the reason why I wanted to respond to this was because I put a question mark here, but I don't know why I'm pretending to be confused. I know exactly what they mean. Although, to be not all fucking Christian people are like anti-trans. It's not like there's a fucking commandment that says, thou shalt not, you know, go through gender affirming surgery or thou shalt not change your fucking name or pronouns or hair length or fucking shit like that. Again, the... Part of the, if I had to guess, the part of the Bible that these people would probably refer to is the part that says, God made you in his own image. He, and they would twist that and contort that, even though it's not what they were, what was being referred to or talked about to be, oh, that means that you can never have gender dysphoria and you can never, you know, change your, your gender or that part of yourself, as if that's what fucking, you know, the people who were writing the Bible meant by that, or were referring to, which is obviously was not, even if I cared, or, you know, gave any credence to the opinions of what those people thought, it's just not what they meant, it's not what they were talking about. Ask them to say, do you want to deny this person treatment, because you pulled this stupid quote from a fucking bible a book that was written like thousands of years ago that says oh everyone's perfect everyone's made perfect you can't change them doesn't make any sense when you're arguing with a religious person about the fucking text that they selectively quote nothing ever makes any fucking sense so that's not new recognizing and acknowledging human biology is not ideological and is not a form of bigotry well no one's no, no one's problem with you is that you're acknowledging human biology or acknowledging their biological sex Believe it or not, every single trans person knows that what biological sex is. In fact, they are painfully, painfully aware of their biological sex not matching 
their gender identity. They they know about biological sex. You're not presenting them with new information. Uh, in fact, talking about biological sex is relevant to this issue because the whole problem that trans people face is that their biological sex does not uh, match the gender identity that's in their mind. And it's really hard to transition fully uh, to a gender identity that does reflect the gender identity in their mind because of their biological sex and because that's hard to change. So the form of bigotry that happens, the bigotry that people are attacking you over is the bigotry over them, the bigotry over their gender identity. That's the problem. Um, these people always seem to talk as if they think no one but them knows that biological sex is a thing. Everyone knows about the chromosomes. Everyone knows about male and sex female organs. You're not surprising anyone. Everyone knows about this. I feel like I had a more well put together, more articulate version of that response to this. But at four and a half hours, I'm finally done.